Microsoft Teams. So I would like to welcome all of the participants and thank you for your time and interest to our event. We have a great panel, uh, both today and tomorrow, uh, to discuss uh, really tectonic events that have taken place in our region. The 44, 44 days long Karabakh conflict, second Karabakh conflict, and the implications of this conflict for the uh, region, uh, for the balance of power in the region, for the geopolitical actors. Um, I think it's important that we uh, draw some initial conclusions about uh, what this war means for uh, major powers, their interest in the region, uh, what does it mean uh, for the regional actors, uh, as well as for Azerbaijan and Armenia. So the main focus of our discussions will be how this uh, conflict and how the, the outcome of the war has changed the geopolitical balance of power in the region, uh, whether there are some winners, losers, how the balance of power will shift, um, and uh, what can we expect for the upcoming uh, several months. Um, we, I should say that this event is organized jointly by ADA University and its uh, Compass uh, project partners, University of Kent and University of Cambridge. Uh, they, we have worked together for more than two years on a joint research and uh, policy recommendations. And uh, today we are very honored to have them as co-organizers of this event. Let me uh, pass the floor to uh, Dr. Yelena Kalastelova from University of Kent. She is the primary uh, coordinator of this research project and uh, she will also give her own perspective on uh, the war and implications of the war. And then after her, I will introduce the, the other panelists as well. Uh, Dr. Yelena Krastelova, the floor is yours. Mute. Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you. Thank you, Faris, and thank you very much for this um, introduction. Just to say it is my particular pleasure and privilege uh, to begin this uh, very timely and very important webinar organized by um, our excellent ADA University team and um, in partnership with the Compass Project. Just to say that we are now coming to the final year, the fourth year of the Compass Project which uh, uh, aims at growing capacity uh, of all of us, uh, meaning the six universities, both Kent, Cambridge, but also our wonderful, excellent regional partners, including Arda University in the first place, and then, of course, Belarusian State University, University of World Economy and Diplomacy, and Tajik National University. So I hope, uh, although it's the Final year, uh, I do hope that our partnership will continue as we will be looking into new beginnings under other future projects, but also continuing our partnership under this heading, um, taking it into the future. So uh, just uh, with the focus on um, the topic itself, I titled my um, short um, intervention as entering the uh, the world of new geopolitics, uh, which um, in my books I see as a, a worrying, new worrying development, because many of us uh, thought that with the end of the Cold War, a ma major change in the 1990s, when the issues of sovereignty were more or less addressed in most cases in Europe, and later on in 2000s, with the rise of international community and increasing cooperation on global issues, for example, climate change or sustainable, sustainable development goals that, for example, our global project also addresses. But also, more recently, the coronavirus pandemic, which actually demonstrated, if anything, we need to do everything together, cooperatively and jointly. So the old-fashioned notion of geopolitics, meaning that power is derived from political exploitation of geography by way of spatializing, be it physical or otherwise, would be a thing of the past, truly forgotten not to be revived again as the world has moved on to a more cooperative modus operandi. But regrettably, what we see today um, is not really the case. 
this was much too of a wishful thinking. What we see today is a return of geopolitics, but of a new kind. It is clear, for example, that even when the um, US discourse focused on making America great again, it was still part and parcel of the superpower repositioning, having a single space for itself um, in global trading or a global denial of climate change or threat of the coronavirus. China, uh, as the other global player, uh, was more creative in this particular sense, speci spatializing its influence via uh, Belt and Road Initiative um, technologies. And now, as we can see, uh, being uh, impacted of, of by coronavirus, but also global developments, is now rethinking about its strategy altogether. Russia, on the other hand, has been pursuing uh, 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 the geopolitical strategy in a very old fashioned way even a physical uh, continuation to rely on the divide and rule principle. And uh, what we see more recently with the appointment of the new European Commission is also that the EU has joined the ranks with the Commission announcing its geopolitical strategic course of action, which connotes in the words of the Commission an approach to distributing military and economic power to increase its global presence which, however, was conspicuously missing in the uh, South Caucasus and in, in, in this particular, uh, in more recent events, failing, basically falling between the stools. So while found in, uh, sounding familiar, this uh, new type of geopolitics uh, used by um, major players in the world to once again to spatialize the international uh, politics and to order space around them without much uh, sometimes often without much consideration of the voices in between. Um, basically, it has uh, some new features, uh, in particular, more skillful creative means of spatializing using technologies, cyber and also economic means. But I think what is more conspicuous here is the lack of leadership and is the lack of creative vision for the future because we still see that it is very much about projecting hard power and flexing muscles, um, which uh, means that it's the game, but taken on a, a, a new level plane, uh, whereby it is less about leadership, but it is actually more responding to the action of the other, which uh, in the new world, uh, increasingly globalizing world, actually is very much a, a step back. But also the implications are very serious of this new old geopolitics, meaning that it is a step back and the return to competition and confrontation rather than cooperation, but also for small states uh, who are caught in between. Um, they, they essentially begin to develop or essentially beginning to develop their voice and aspirations for the future, it becomes a peace, piecemeal in their struggle for survival. So what I say here, I can hear voices, but sorry. <laughs> what I say here, just to conclude my short presentation, is that especially in Azerbaijan case, having survived this hard, difficult, um, debilitating war, we need a new vision, we need a new strategy forward, because without it, we will not be able to survive in this VUCA wall, the wall of vulnerability, increasing vulnerability, increasing uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Um, and with this in mind, actually, we as a Compass project, we as a team, we are developing this new idea under the, um, uh, the, the headlines of complexity, but also using uh, the very much traditional mentality of the region, uh, which, for example, it, in Tajik sounds as Hamsoya. I know in Uzbek it sounds as Koshni or Konshu, kon, kon, but there is a very similar word in Azeri, uh, Azeri language, uh, which means that we live uh, being conscious of uh, the world around us. We are part of that world, the world that is becoming both simple and complex, both global and local, but most of all, never linear, deterministic or predictable, the world we are part of. And in that sense, 
if basically if what is happening on the ground today and in particular in Azerbaijan more recently, when the local actually very much determines global politics and the game between global players, where the voice of Azerbaijan becomes often neglected and needs to be reinforced. I think we need to fundamentally relearn where we are coming from and fundamentally reshape uh, the, the, the rules and the uh, objectives of the game. I would say in a complex world, and this with this I'm going to conclude my short presentation, is that uh, we know that history is predetermined and we can't really change anything uh, much about it, although we can provide different interpretation of it. We also know that the present is is about emergence and emerging opportunities. But what we also know is the future still remains very much unpredictable. So in this new world of geopolitics, in fact, new and harsh geopolitics, we need to seize the opportunity and we need to understand the present in order to build a more sustainable future of tomorrow. And I would then urge Azerbaijan to find its own voice uh, and have it stronger than before in uh, finding its own right place in this new geopolitical game. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krasteleva. Thank you for your support to this project. And uh, it has been really a pleasure to collaborate with you and to collaborate with University of Kent and University of Cambridge. Uh, we have also uh, professors from University of Cambridge also uh, with us here. Uh, Monte, good to see you as well. Uh, it's great to have you as partners for ADA University. And now I would like to uh, pass the floor to our panelists. We have excellent panelists today and we have excellent panelists tomorrow to discuss the geopolitical shifts in the Caucasus, in the region. Um, people who have both practical and theoretical experience working with this region. And I have tried to bring various uh, you know, perspectives into these discussions. We have Americans, Europeans, uh, Turkish representatives, representatives from the region itself. So it would be really good to hear to each of the panelists and to understand what is the differences in the perspectives, what is the differences in the opinions, and uh, how this part of the world is viewed from various, um, uh, you know, uh, countries. Uh, first, uh, I would like to give the floor to Ambassador Matt Breiza. He is, um, of course, very well known expert in the region. He served as ambassador. Uh, of United States in Azerbaijan. He has been involved with Minsk Group as a co-chair, so he knows all the details of the Karabakh conflict. Uh, and he is still very much linked to the region because he's based in Turkey and he's working with various think tanks related to our region. Ambassador Breiser, I would like to welcome you on behalf of our university. And I pass you the floor for initial uh, remarks, and then we will also have some Q&A session as well. Thank you, Mr. Executive Vice Rector, dear friend Faris. Um, how, how long should I should I do these opening remarks? Yeah, I, I, I would like each panelist to make some uh, brief uh, introductory remarks, no longer than 10, 10 minutes, and okay. then we will open it up for Q&A. Perfect. So uh, I guess what I'd like to do is describe how Washington and Paris seem to have interpreted or misinterpreted this war. Uh, and then uh, I'll touch on a couple of maybe four geostrategic implications that I think are also being overlooked in Washington and, and uh, 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 building on what, uh, what uh, Elena said in the opening. Yeah, geopolitics is, is, is back in a big way here. And I, I don't ever think it really left the stage, although we would have preferred that it did. Um, so in Washington and certainly in Paris, uh, uh, we've seen a, a, the, the traditional sort of tilt toward Armenia, certainly in domestic politics in the United States. Uh, but also in national politics uh, in, in, in France. And, you know, it, it wasn't just the French Senate's uh, passing of the, of the resolution uh, inviting the French government to recognize the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, after uh, the war. But long before, it was, there were consistent accusations that really, believe it or not, that Turkey was pushing Azerbaijan to launch a war against Armenia and that Turkey uh, was encouraging uh, Azerbaijan to be, I don't know how else to put it, even more aggressive. But even saying those words sounds kind of crazy to me. But but a former colleague of mine who I respected deeply, who he worked a lot on the South Caucasus at the Pentagon, um, he actually asked me that 
leading an open question in another webinar a couple of months ago. He said, Matt, don't you think it's terrible that Turkey pushed Azerbaijan forward and is, and is encouraging Azerbaijan to be so aggressive? Uh, and then we would also hear uh, well, from Secretary of State Pompeo uh, and from others uh, the fact that Turkey should back off. Uh, and that uh, it should it should uh, not outside power shouldn't get involved uh, and that the fighting should simply stop without any understanding of what actually has happened. So in my mind, and thanks to you, Fariz, and to Damien for letting me write an article uh, for uh, Baku Dialogues uh, in this current issue. Uh, in that ar article, I outline how Prime Minister Pashinyan provoked this war. He provoked it. He wanted it. Uh, we all know, right, that the previous formula that was negotiated together with the Minsk Group co-chairs for a Nagorno-Karabakh peace settlement was land for peace. And according to the Madrid principles, which, by the way, were agreed in principle in January 2009 by then Armenian President Sarge Sarkisyan and by President Ilham Aliyev, they agreed, they accepted them in principle with the understanding that uh, many details would still need to be finalized and they never were finalized. But the land for peace formula is that the seven Azerbaijani territories around Nagorno-Karabakh are returned to Azerbaijan's control. Uh, and in exchange, the Armenian side gets uh, uh, peacekeeping force and, and peace guarantees that uh, of peaceful continued uh, living in Nagorno-Karabakh itself, not in the seven territories. Uh, and then in, in, in those basic principles, there also was a provision uh, that said Nagorno-Karabakh will receive an interim legal status and that status will be finalized at some point in the undefined future through some type of a vote of whomever is resident of Nagorno-Karabakh at the time. So the, that was a land for peace formula. Um, about a year and a half ago, or in early 2019, both the then defense minister of Armenia, David Tonyan, and Prime Minister Pashinyan said, no, we're replacing land for peace with a new doctrine of new territories for new wars. We, Armenia, no longer want land for peace. We're going to pursue new wars for new territories. Um, that didn't get a lot of attention in Washington or Paris or, or anywhere else outside the South Caucasus. And then month after month, Pashinyan basically delivered uh, on that pledge, whether it be the provocative actions of uh, saying Armenia is independent, period, uh, which, which that was in August, I guess, of, of uh, 2019. Um, or whether uh, he mentioned the Treaty of Sevres again uh, this past August, or the, move, the moving of the uh, legislature of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, from Hankendi Stepanakert uh, to Shusha, the most sensitive spot on the map for Azerbaijanis, as we all know. Um, so I think um, I, I got to a point where President Aliyev saw that there simply wasn't going to be any way to continue the negotiations uh, because Pashinyan abandoned them. Uh, oh, and Pashinyan also uh, formally said, I, I abandon, I, we're giving up on the Madrid principles. Um, and so we got, we got the war. Um, so now geopolitically, wh what does it all mean? Um, well, one, geopolitically, uh, the November 9-10 agreement, I think, lays the foundation for a, for a period of stability. Um, because the, the, the points in that uh, declaration or statement are essentially the basic principles that, again, both parties had agreed to in January 2009 in principle, minus any possibility for a change in the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. So for now, as we look into the future, um, a, a flashpoint in the South Caucasus has been removed. Granted, the Armenians who remain in Nagorno-Karabakh for whatever period of time, they, they will eventually want to or will demand uh, that the status of Nagorno-Karabakh be put back on the table. France is already pushing for that. Um, but I don't see any chance in the near future that Azerbaijan will agree to that. Why would it? Uh, as President Putin said in his uh, a, a amazing interview that he did uh, shortly after the war, uh, he said on October 19 and 20, I had a conversation with both President Aliyev and President pa uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan. President Aliyev agreed to stop the fighting as long as Azerbaijan would be able to retain Shusha. Uh, the, same, the same proposal was put to Pashinyan by Putin, and Putin said Pashinyan would not agree. Putin said Pashinyan said, we were gonna, we're, we'll continue fighting because we can't accept the return of Azerbaijani internally, internally displaced persons to Shusha. And Putin himself says in this interview, I couldn't figure out why he didn't accept this offer. 
the fighting continued, and it was very costly for Armenia because due to their dramatic military defeat, their diplomatic defeat was even greater uh, because they lost, again, any possibility of negotiations to change Nagorno-Karabakh's legal status. Um, so one, th that's, that's one, I think, important regional geopolitical uh, outcome. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, for all intents and purposes, for now, is, has become more a, a nettlesome and difficult political problem rather than uh, a, a conflict in which military uh, operations are likely. So, so the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, in a way, is in that sense, is akin to the Cyprus question. Um, there is not going to be any major military activity on Cyprus, but it's 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 a difficult political question that that is frankly geopolitically uh, annoying. Uh, another uh, huge geopolitical uh, development is is the fact that Russia and Turkey have obviously filled the diplomatic vacuum uh, in, in in Azerbaijan, and that, that came about in my mind at least. Uh, after the July uh, military operations, pretty far from Nagorno-Karabakh, but along the Armenia-Azerbaijani border. Um, the U.S. and France, the other two co-chairs, didn't really react at all. But Russia, uh, shortly after the, the military operations ended, as you recall, called SNAP military uh, exercises with Armenia, including with troops from Russia's 102nd Army base uh, at, at Gyumri, Armenia. And then Turkey followed suit shortly thereafter with military exercises with Azerbaijan. And it was clear the way the diplomatic uh, posturing was going. Russia and Turkey had filled that diplomatic vacuum in, in Azerbaijan and in the South Caucasus. That's a big deal. So it means the U.S. has been totally sidelined. France has sidelined itself. I hope in the Biden administration, um, the, President Biden's and, and Secretary of State designate uh, Anthony Blinken's systematic and strategic way that they, they look at uh, international relations will make the South Caucasus again a prominent issue uh, on the presidential agenda. But who knows what's going to happen? Um, continuing with this Russia and Turkey geopolitical change. Um, so Russia now has what it's wanted for decades, which is a, a military presence, a, a bigger military presence than than just at Gabala, uh, with a peacekeeping force that is actually quite a bit stronger than your typical peacekeeping force. And some analysts think Russia is trying to set up a protectorate in the future, sort of like in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, that said, the task, the peacekeeping task of Russia uh, at this moment, at that moment in time on November 9, 10, uh, required a heavy peacekeeping contingent, I would, I would argue, because the fighting, the, the troops were, had just stopped fighting. We just saw, what, a week and a half ago, how the Armenian, uh, either regular or irregular forces attacked Azerbaijani forces near Hadrut. The Russian peacekeepers intervened. So you need a, a heavy uh, Russian peacekeeping force. But, but now Russia does have this geopolitical tool of a heavy peacekeeping force that it will probably uh, strengthen. Uh, and it can use, and hopefully not in, in the equally nefarious ways, it's used peacekeepers in Georgia and Moldova. But that's all counterbalanced by the presence of Turkish peacekeepers. Turkish peacekeepers from, from maybe Washington's or Paris perspective maybe aren't a positive phenomenon right now because of how terrible U.S.-Turkey relations have become and, and France-Turkey relations have become. But from Russia's perspective, Turkish troops are NATO troops. So NATO has a military presence on the ground in Azerbaijan that provides some sort of a countervailing force or counterbalance to the Russian peacekeepers. Granted, the Turkish peacekeepers at this point are only conducting mine clearing uh, activities, and then they will be the personnel together with the Russians in the peacekeeping center. But President Erdogan has made clear there are going to be more Turkish peacekeeping troops on the ground in Azerbaijan, and Russia doesn't get a vote. So that's a big geopolitical shift. And finally, my last point is the ninth point, the final point of the November 9-10 statement uh, makes a dramatic commitment by all parties to reopen all transit routes, all transit routes that have been closed. That means Armenia, Azerbaijan, and that means Armenia, Turkey, eventually. Uh, and just imagine when, when, when there's that corridor that links Nakhchivan across uh, Megri uh, district in Armenia to the rest of Azerbaijan. Um, imagine how that can be used to, to change the ge geopolitical dynamic in a more positive way. I mean, immediately, Nakhchivan will be much less dependent on Iran. That's something not appreciated at all yet in Washington, uh, or, or in Paris for that matter. Uh, number two, um, Armenia can now be integrated into new infrastructure projects that pass them by. 
Um, in, um, I live in the private sector now here in Turkey. I'm on the board of an energy company here, and, and we're already hearing about commercial plans, maybe to build a natural gas pipeline through that corridor, along with the railroad from Turkey. I'm sure there, there'll be a new, a new road that's built. So this corridor from the Caspian Sea, it's Azerbaijan, Georgia, into Turkey, to the Black Sea, to the Mediterranean Sea, it could now also include Armenia. Uh, and, and that then also will provide a geopolitical counterbalance uh, to Russia's presence in, in, in a much stronger way now uh, on Azerbaijani territory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Breiser. This is excellent analysis. And two very important sentences caught my attention. One was about the word, you, you used the word sidelined, France and U.S. feel sidelined. And the second word I, that caught my attention was that peacekeeping forces by Russia on November 9 was very important to maintain peace. And that seems to me something that some American diplomats and some American State Department representatives still disagree with because recently there was a statement by State Department officials saying that Russian peacekeepers is actually a destructive force. And you seem to agree, you seem to say that it is important to maintain peace in the region, at least at the fragile time when still emotions are high. Uh, we will come back to this issue. Now I would like to pass the floor to Ambassador Farid Shafiyev, uh, who is our adjunct faculty. But uh, of course, this is not his full-time job. His full-time job is he is the director of Baku-based Center for International Relations or International Affairs. And uh, previously, as you know, Ambassador Farid Shafiyev was Azerbaijan's diplomat, ambassador in Czech Republic and Canada. And Canada. And I think that it is important for us to hear his perspective as well. Ambassador Shafiev, the floor is yours. Thank you, Varis. And I would like also uh, to greet all our colleagues and friends here, the students, expert diplomats. I know some of the diplomats joined. And um, thank you for organizing this timely uh, event with a uh, very important topic. Um, I, I'll try not to repeat the, what has been told before me. Um, and rather, I would probably f focus on uh, in speaking about the uh, geopolitics because it's indeed very extensive topic, starting in mean, United States elections, the European Union, Brexit, China, Russia. But rather, uh, let's focus what's going on in our region and indeed we are dealing with new geopolitical realities, as you mentioned, Faris after the Second Karabakh War. So the, the few, few lessons from the Second Karabakh War to the whole international community. Uh, the, 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 the first uh, lesson that, you know, that the situation which led, I mean, I mean uh, the Ambassador Bryce already uh, gave the picture of how we came to that situation, so I'm not going to repeat that, just to tell that um, the situation when we had no peace, no war. The situation when we had, on one hand, United Nations security resolutions demanding the withdrawal of Armenian troops. On the other hand, we have seen complete ignorance and lack of pressure on Armenia from the international community, from the major regional and global players to uh, abide uh, uh, to, the, to the spirit and letters of the UN. UN Security Council resolutions led eventually to the war. Um, I'm again uh, skipping the, all these, um, let's say, details, uh, the Pashinyan's behavior, the previous two Karabakh's clan, uh, so we know, know all that, but just in, in principle, that situation uh, was coming uh, for a long time. The, 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 the second lesson, I think, uh, you're yeah, right. Uh, some, um, again, I'm, I'm referring to global and regional powers. They believe that sometimes they, if it's very hard to, to resolve the conflict, then the best uh, the strategy is freeze and forget. So definitely it's a very temporary solution, freeze and forget. Uh, that uh, frozen conflict can be ignited very quickly for a number of reasons. And um, the, the, the third lesson, uh, I believe now I would like to focus on Azerbaijan and look what is going to, to might happen after five years or ten years. Azerbaijan never reconciled with the fact of occupation. 
never reconciled with the previous status quo and worked uh, towards the, that goal of restoration of territorial integrity through political, through military means, through diplomatic means, enforcing its army, um, making um, relevant steps on the diplomatic front in the UN, in other international organizations on, on the legal front, and reach the goal. So at least we uh, they occupied several regions outside of uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, from Nagorno-Karabakh, I would like also, and 30% uh, of uh, former Nagorno-Karabakh. Now the question about the, some territories which is not under full control of Azerbaijani uh, administration, I would say. So um, I know there's a conversation about the, this, the, what will be the future of that particular area. But I, again, I would like to emphasize that Azerbaijan will work again with determination to restore uh, fully its administration over its nationally recognized territory. Uh, the new uh, geopolitical situation which we have is conducive for the future peace. Peace uh, based on, first of all, the, the, on, on the principle of territorial integrity which basically free both Armenian and Azerbaijan from the legacy of the, the past conflict, of the legacy of, of the fighting. Uh, definitely, it's not easy, and we, like, we shouldn't expect uh, that tomorrow Azerbaijanis and Armenians can reconcile quite easily. Probably the wounds are very fresh anyway, but uh, that's the goal, I think, uh, uh, should be in both countries and also the whole international community. Uh, I'm reading, uh, you know, you can find a plethora of articles in international media. Unfortunately, what I, I noticed that more kind of the, it's all about geopolitics, about Turkey, about Russia, but very few uh, about the fate of people in the region, fate of uh, Azerbaijanis who are waiting uh, IDPs, because uh, formally, yes, the territory is the infrastructure is fully destroyed, and Azerbaijan needs the billions of dollars to invest and restore those territories. Um, uh, so uh, IDPs uh, in the future might return. Uh, but you know, situation in Armenia is not um, is not uh, bright either. Unfortunately, they, uh, the society remained the hostage of the, this uh, irredentist project, uh, Great Armenia, and Nagorno claim on Nagorno-Karabakh is also part of that claim. And here, uh, the Ambassador Bryce already mentioned the, this, uh, the decision of France and some others. Unfortunately, this myopic vision, you know, France is more interested in its own geopolitical game, its in own rivalry with Turkey, rather than in the fate of Armenians. And um, what indeed the, the whole situation, Armenian lobby invested millions of dollars in these irredentist projects, and now it's, it's fully gone. I mean, all this investment gone. Uh, Armenian people did not uh, benefit from uh, this project. So I would say that, um, and we, we know that for 20 years, Armenia was ruled by the clan uh, warlords, Kocharyan and Sarkisyan. They embezzled funds. Uh, we see in what uh, shape was the Ar Armenian army. Uh, but that's the one side of the coin. The, the other side of the coin is the nationalist Armenian lobby groups, like ANCA, Armenian Assembly of America, in a, the, the lobby groups in, in in France, in some other countries, uh, they are not really um, thinking uh, in the long term uh, about the Armenians' geography and Armenians uh, as a people who continue to immigrate uh, from Armenia. So despite 27 years of occupation, Armenia didn't become richer. Armenian people in terms of de demography did not become uh, bigger in digits, in numbers of uh, population, 
But basically, that the policy is fully bankrupt. And what indeed international community and global players, European Union, can do is to convince Armenian uh, political and uh, leadership uh, to work with the political, uh, with the elite, with the intellectuals in Armenia, to, wo uh, to work to restore, uh, I mean, the normal relationship with Turkey and Azerbaijan. Of course, Azerbaijan also has to do some homework. I'm speaking about the restoration of uh, occupied territories, uh, but also maybe slowly we have to work uh, uh, towards the reconciliation efforts uh, and, you know, future coexistence of Armenia. Okay. I will finish my, my remarks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador uh, Shafiev. Um, I really, really like how you ended your presentation with uh, the future focus on reconciliation because I recently saw a few Armenians writing along the same lines and saying that the future of region is not in revenge but in reconciliation. But one question for you to keep in mind when we reach Q&A session is whether Azerbaijan is putting itself in risk by uh, with, in a situation when uh, Western influence is decreasing in the region. Can we expect that declining Western influence in the region or Western participation in the region will eventually put Azerbaijan's national security at risk. So please keep that question in mind when we reach Q&A session. Now I would like to pass the floor to another very good friend of our university, um, Dr. Svante Cornell. Uh, so Dr. Fran Svante Cornell uh, is uh, you know, dividing his time between Sweden and US. He is a, di a director of uh, Central Asia Caucasus Institute. Uh, but he also spends a lot of time in Sweden at Institute of Security and Development. Um, of course, we in Azerbaijan know Dr. Svante Cornell as author of a monograph book uh, about Azerbaijan since independence. So I think that maybe there is a good reason for Dr. Svante Cornell to write another book as a continuation of that. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Cornell, and the floor is yours. Give us some European perspective as well, please. Uh, thank you, Fariz. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. And I'm glad to have so many friends on the panel. Matt Breiza, of course, uh, for so many years. Um, Farid and others. Uh, it's it's great to be with all of you. Uh, I don't think I can necessarily promise a, a European perspective because my perspective does not necessarily reflect very much about Europe. Uh, it's only my perspective, uh, whatever that is worth. Um, but uh, I, I will try to provide you a few of the um, of the uh, conclusions I have made about this. I think, first of all, that the uh, the situation we have in the South Caucasus now, including the recent war, reflects a, a broader transformation that we've seen uh, for a while. And I think the American author Robert Kaplan summarized it very well in his book called Marco, The Return of Marco Polo's World, when he talks about how the uh, the era of some types of rules and norms that were restricting the behavior of great powers is giving way to a situation where you know great powers really do what they can think they can get away with uh, so we have a much more uh, unstable and insecure environment surrounding the south caucasus and i think what we're seeing uh, is uh, is is a reflection of this now i i I agree with very much of what's been said uh, here. I think one of the clearest, broad, in, in broad terms, geopolitical um, conclusions we can draw from, from from the situation surrounding the war that just happened is the uh, irrelevance of Western powers to the developments on the ground. And I think we can compare this to 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia, uh, when uh, the West really was able to affect and to some extent restrict Russian behavior. And I know, of course, uh, Ambassador Breiza can speak to a great detail about what happened. Uh, in the case of the Armenia-Azerbaijan war, uh, they did not really try. And I think um, there are several factors behind this. And I, I think we need to look deeper at some point, probably not right now, but we need to look deeper at these factors because that determines how we what we should conclude about the about the presence of the West in the region. Um, I think one aspect, of course, is that Western powers, uh, as you know, have been affected much worse than most of the rest of the world by the pandemic and were focused very much on, on domestic affairs. But I think it's also, I, I mentioned the 2008 comparison because it seems to me that the, uh, the difference is really that there was a big, there was something at stake for Western powers in 2008 
there wasn't really that much at stake in this war. And I think this reflects a lot of the misjudgments that the Armenian side has made about the international reactions to this conflict. Uh, they somehow thought that for, for because there is so much sympathy towards Armenians because of historical reasons, because of, you know, in some circles at least, common Christian solidarity elements yeah. and so on, that this would translate into some form of action on behalf of their friends in the world to help them avoid a negative fallout in the war. Uh, but that was a mistake. And I think the, the point is that the Armenians did not understand that the world had not recognized the annexation uh, of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, or if they, in their terms, the so-called independence of uh, of, of Armenia uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh, and therefore nobody was going to come to, to to help Armenia safeguard its military conquest. So I think it may be an exaggeration to conclude that just because the West did not react to this, that the West was irrelevant. Uh, or is irrelevant to the geopolitics of the Caucasus. Now, obviously, the United States has not paid attention to central, to the Caucasus in the past many years, uh, but I think we should note that there has been a growing realization of the geopolitical importance of the broader region, which we see in the launch and implementation of uh, a U.S. strategy for Central Asia, and also a European strategy for Central Asia. Now, they have seemed to both have forgotten that you need the Caucasus to get to Central Asia, but step by step, I think we're seeing gradually uh, a growing realization of the importance of this part of the world, and I don't think that's going to change because of a change in administration, and I think Matt Breiser was absolutely right about that. And I think especially when we look to the forward for Azerbaijan, the issue of reconstruction, as has been mentioned, is absolutely critical. And here, I think the Western role in uh, major international financial institutions and the like is uh, so significant that uh, you cannot just ignore it. It's going to be very relevant to deal with Western powers. Now, much has been said about Turkey and Russia. Uh, I don't want to say too much about this. Just a few quick points. I think, first of all, it's, it's a little too early to make uh, strong conclusions, and I'll mention why. Uh, with Russia, I think there's a big question what Russia has been winning and what Russia has been losing. Yes, I think it's clear that Russia stepped in and took control in the actual territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, I think it's, you could say, with a little bit of a, a twinkle that uh, Armenia lost the occupied territories to Azerbaijan and lost Nagorno-Karabakh itself to Russia. And particularly if we see the, uh, the tendencies of uh, distributing Russian passports and the like in Nagorno-Karabakh, it's very, very likely, and I, I believe this from the start, that there would be a, um, a, a, a situation similar to Abkhazia, or maybe even more specifically South Ossetia, which is just a military installation uh, that is very useful to Russia with a local population that is very small and totally beholden to the Russian military base. I think it looks to me now that this will be the uh, the future, at least in the immediate years, of the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Um, now, why did this happen? I think one clear reason why Russia stepped in was because nobody else did. Uh, as was mentioned here, some, something was needed to, to stop the war, and nobody else seemed interesting to, interested in doing it, which I think came as a big surprise, certainly to Armenia, maybe even to some people in Azerbaijan. So Russia did step in, and obviously did whatever it could to maximize its own benefits from the situation. I think that's absolutely normal, and that's what anybody could have expected. But I think the important part is that this was not anything that Russia planned. Uh, I know that there are many theories, conspiracies, ideas about who was behind all of this, who created all of this violence. But no, I, I, it seems to me that this development that happened was not part of Russia plans. They reacted to events. They were not drivers of events. And I think the important part to, to, to remember is that Russia's ambition is always to be the driver of events in this part of the world and not to be the one that's reacting to events. And if you look at it from this point of view, everything that's happening in the region, in Belarus, in Kyrgyzstan, and even if you go back to what's happened in Ukraine, what's happened in Georgia in the past 10, 12 years, all of this are elements of Russia reacting to events that it was un unable to control. I usually put it a little bit, you know, maybe it's an exaggeration, but to say that, well, Russia wanted Georgia, they lost Georgia, so they grabbed Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Russia wanted Ukraine. Well, they couldn't have Ukraine, they understood with the Euromaidan, so they grabbed Crimea and they grabbed as much as they could of the Donbass. And similarly here, Russia wants to have influence and control over the whole of the South Caucasus, including Armenia and Azerbaijan. Well, that didn't work out, so they just grab what they can grab, which in this case happens to be Nagorno-Karabakh. 
So I think we have to wait and see. But it seems to me that we should not necessarily conclude that Russia has won a lot in terms of influence. It doesn't seem to me that if you go around in Baku, you don't see Russian flags. You see Turkish flags, you see some Pakistani flags, some Israeli flags. You do not see Russian flags. And certainly in Armenia, the feeling of of, of being uh, left hang out to dry by the Russians is very palpable. Now on Turkey, I think it's much more clear that Turkey has made gains and established itself as a as a clear force of influence in the region. I also think we have to be a little bit cautious and we have to be cautious mainly because we see very serious structural weaknesses in Turkey, not least on the economic front. And I think all, as much as I, uh, you know, I have been personally very much a critic of many of the domestic policies of President Erdogan, but I think it is clear that Turkey played a, uh, I think on the whole, a constructive role in this conflict in order to help Azerbaijan effectively, uh, as the president has mentioned many times, implement UN Security Council resolutions. I wish it didn't have to happen through war, uh, but I don't find any reason to fault Turkey for its behavior. I think the Western overreaction, and in many ways the Western negative reaction to Azerbaijan, well, had a lot to do with uh, the general, um, how should I put it, the general um, antipathy towards President Erdogan, which unfortunately he has brought unto himself by many of his statements and, men, and a lot of his behaviors in other areas. Uh, and we see to, to a certain extent that there is a price uh, for Azerbaijan to be paid by being very closely affiliated with Erdogan. I think that's a price worth paying for Azerbaijan, by the way, but I think it's something we have to be aware of. Now, uh, the, the situation of the Turkish economy is extremely serious, as anybody living in Turkey can tell you, and I think Azerbaijan has to be prepared, uh, and I again, I want to be very clear, I, uh, I am not a critic of Turkish policy, I think Turkey and Azerbaijan are uh, should be very close allies, but I think Azerbaijan has to be aware of the risks that what could happen if there is a deep economic crisis in Turkey. That could create a situation in which Azerbaijan suddenly is left without Turkish support because Turkey has to focus on domestic developments. I don't think this has to happen, but I think Azerbaijani policymakers have to factor in the possibility that this is this is quite a big possibility. This, this could happen. It doesn't have to happen, but it could. Now, obviously, you don't have to go back to 1919 when there was a clear precedent for this, when obviously Azerbaijan uh, had a very close alliance with the uh, with with, with uh, the Ottoman Empire at the time. Then the empire collapsed, and Azerbaijan. We know what happened. I'm, I don't suggest that anything like this is going to happen again. But I think Azerbaijan has to be aware, and I think Azerbaijan is aware that it. Yes, Turkey is its, its biggest friend, its biggest ally, but it has to stand on its own legs, and it cannot rely on anybody, be it Turkey or be it anybody else, because anything can happen, and it's a very unpredictable world. Now let me uh, finish by saying. A few words about what I think is the biggest, um, <clears throat> the really the biggest um, uh, conclusion that I draw uh, from the developments uh, that we have seen, and that is, if you will, the agency of local states. Now, uh, back to uh, our many of us knew Zbigniew Brzezinski and his book, The Grand Chessboard, and I think we have all continued. Uh, to view the region from the pr prism, if you will, of a grand chessboard. Now, the problem with the chessboard analogy is that who are the players and who are the pieces on the chessboard? Uh, and we have still a lot of us, at least outside of, of the region, have a view of, um, of the geopolitics of the Caucasus, of Central Asia, of broader Eurasia, as the geopolitics of a chessboard where the big powers are playing a game and the smaller countries are just pawns on the board. And, and we forget that the pieces of the chessboard are very much alive uh, and that they are they have agency. They are drivers of events very frequently. And I think what we're seeing now in, in certain ways, I think this war was a clear evidence of this. I completely agree with the analysis that's been made here that Mr. Pashinyan uh, was a had agency in the terms that it wasn't Russia that pushed Armenia towards making all these miscalculations that led to the war. It was Armenian decision makers themselves. And I think even this happened against Russian wishes. More importantly, it was the agency of Azerbaijan that ended the status quo and, if you will, restored uh, the territorial integrity to the country. Similarly, we look east, we see the same thing happening in Central Asia, which is that at least two states have shown an incredible amount of agency, which is Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, how they have begun to take charge of their region. Central Asia is no longer a place where we, just, we can just talk about 
you know, the Russians, the Chinese, the, the Indians, the, the Iranians, the Americans, or whoever else playing a game. The, the main actors in Central Asia, I would say today, are the two large countries of Central Asia, particularly because they are cooperating with one another. They are trying to build institutions of regional cooperation. Uh, and they are, in, in principle, focus, forcing external powers to try to, to use the smaller countries in order to slow that down and to, 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 to if you would, divide and rule the way they always have. I mentioned this because I think what we're seeing in Central Asia and the Caucasus is that there are now three countries that can really be termed uh, mid-sized countries that are independent powers that have a strong ability to be uh, drivers of events and to determine uh, developments because remember uh, great powers have a lot on their plate they have a lot of domestic things they have a lot of other areas outside south caucasus south caucasus and central asia that they have to care about uh, and uh, if you are in the region and if you have your own resources you are focused 100 percent all the time on your region the outsiders are not even the russians even the chinese the turks and the iranians which means i think we have now a situation in which kazakhstan uzbekistan and azerbaijan are really three powers that are uh, have proven themselves to be um, actors uh, and drivers of events in the region. And I think this war definitely made, I think one of the biggest uh, accomplishments of Azerbaijan is making clear to everybody that Azerbaijan, uh, if you will, uh, creates its own future and doesn't do, allow anybody else to do that. Now, obviously there's a bifurcation in the region because this is not true for all the regional states. Smaller states are still weak. Some of them are still beholden to um, uh, to outside powers or are can be easily destabilized by outside powers. But I think increasingly, uh, and I, I, I see signs of this, that Azerbaijan is increasingly interested in its uh, relationship with Central Asian states and acting together with uh, countries like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, it's possible to take charge of your own region rather than having outsiders do it. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Svante Cornell. And I really like your point about the mid powers i think that is very correct for our region at least uh, middle powers and uh, you made very important point also about the inst international institutions financial institutions which the reconstruction works and it seems to me that azerbaijan is holding a lot of anger towards some european powers especially france but also us for its double standards and i think that somehow the future participation of these Western powers in the uh, international financial institutions and reconstruction works should not be forgo for, 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 forgotten. So I, I like that point. And uh, even there's a lot of media reports in Azerbaijan that, you know, some Western powers will not be even allowed to participate in the reconstruction works. So I, I read it on a daily basis. Uh, thank you so much for your intervention. We have one of the participants sharing his personal emails here. I think he doesn't realize that we can read his personal mails. That's very risky. So please turn off your uh, screen. Uh, now it is my great honor to introduce our last panelist, last but not least panelist, um, Dr. Aicha Ergun from Middle East Technical University, another our partner institution and partner uh, professor. Uh, she has been coming to ADA University to teach, to uh, train, and uh, we're very happy and very lucky that she has joined our panel to give us a bit of Turkish perspective. Dr. Ayça Ergün, the floor is yours. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I feel like I'm on the AD AD ADA campus as of now, uh, so it's a great pleasure to see all of you, some of you on the screen and talk about the fate of the South Caucasus and fate of Azerbaijan actually, which I believe all of us love. So basically, uh, I guess, I mean, it's up to me to kind of talk about a little bit on the Turkish perspective, but before the um, kind of, before the discussion of the Turkish perspective or my interpretation of the Turkish perspective, I think we have to underline some of the facts. First of all, I mean, the scholars of post-Soviet uh, transformation, they keep on going, uh, discussing the issues of patterns of continuity and patterns of change in order to understand, in order to conceptualize social, political and economic transition or transformation in the region for the last 30 years. I guess now patterns of change and, and usually I call it as the conflicting coexistence of patterns of change and continuity, which will probably determine the fate of the 
post-Soviet countries in the region. I think that now we can also talk about patterns of change and continuity in relation to foreign policy and in relation to the changing dynamics uh, of the geopolitics in the region. So we first, I think, have to underline the fact that after the Second Karabakh War, Azerbaijan consolidated its statehood and it consolidated its nationhood. And I think it will kind of provide a basis for Azerbaijan to uh, get to have better integration to the political economic structures of the uh, of the of the Western world. I mean, through Baku Tbilisi pipeline uh, and mainly the transportation project, it's also well integrated. But with this uh, trust and belief in the consolidated nationhood and statehood, I think Azerbaijan became much more independent uh, actor. Uh, who also creates mutual dependence with the other regional actors, particularly with Turkey that I will be talking about later on. Uh, as you all know, I mean, the nature of the relationship between these two countries, between Azerbaijan and Turkey, is usually referred to as one nation, two states. And I guess the Second Karabakh War provided the basis or paved the way to the reinterpretation of this discourse or reinterpretation of this motto. I think uh, both countries, obviously, they enjoyed quite privileged and special relationship uh, at the societal level, at the political elite level, at the economic level, at the cultural level that we all know. But I think that, I mean, the Karabakh War, the Second Karabakh War actually changed the nature of the bilateral relationship between Turkey and Azerbaijan, which will have a big, a very influential role in shaping the geopolitics or the geostrategical position within the South Caucasus in general. I think that, I mean, the, the nature of the relationship, the relationships are now much more deepened. Uh, they are more special, they are more exceptional, and they are more privileged. So I'm not only talking about the role and more political and moral support provided by Turkey to Azerbaijan in the Second uh, Karabakh War, but I, I would like to underline what has changed in the last 30 years. So basically, Turkey's support to Azerbaijan and Turkey's denial to build up the bilateral relationships with Armenia is something obvious, is something that we know already. However, uh, I think uh, Turkey redefined its role through its involvement to the Second Karabakh War. It uh, redefined its role in the South Caucasus in three respects. One is uh, Turkey decided uh, to become more proactive you may say that it was an active actor anyway, which I wouldn't agree. Yes, it has provided a lot of support, moral, political support, all regional and international platforms to Azerbaijan on the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh that we know. The diplomats collaborated a lot, propagated a lot. But I think uh, this is the first time in Turkish foreign policy that Turkey took a more proactive role even, even before Russia to get into uh, the conflict or into the discourse or into the discussions of the conflict. So this is something new in Turkish foreign policy. It is new because, I mean, the former Soviet Union uh, the, or the post-Soviet countries, they have been agenda, uh, they, they, they were part of the Turkish foreign policy agenda, but it never become a kind of an area of priority. So obviously in this respect, Azerbaijan or the bilateral relationship with Azerbaijan is an exception, that is true. However, particularly in the last 20 years, even before, actually, we wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that this was the first priority for Turkish foreign, foreign policy. Uh, of course, the bilateral relations uh, with Azerbaijan is an exception. So I think Turkey created its own place or reinterpreted its own place and status uh, in the region by becoming more proactive uh, in the Second Karabakh War. And it can be seen not only at the political elite level, so I mean, it's quite uh, a well-known knowledge that public opinion, they support each other, they like each other, all these discourses of brotherhood and sisterhood, etc. I think that for the first time in the last 30 years, in the, in the, uh, since the declaration of independence of Azerbaijan, public opinion in Turkey uh, kind of uh, uh, restored its image, its perception about Azerbaijan through the Second Karabakh War. So basically, there is this full coverage of the war in Turkish televisions, uh, in all TV channels. Uh, people, ordinary people, or kind of, you know, doctors, uh, students, they were really active in social media. 
So basically, it's kind of an instinctive pro, 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 initiative on part of the Turkish people to support Azerbaijan in the Second Karabakh War. So I think this is the basis of the exceptional relationship. It is not the political elite initiative. Whomever will be in power will definitely devote itself to this cause. And I think the most important reason uh, why this is the case is the popular support, is the support of the public opinion in both countries. Second, Turkey appeared as a game changer in the region. So particularly in July, I mean, Russia being kind of a more quiet or reluctant in making assessments or uh, assessments or evaluations or raising its voice, Turkey became a game changer in, in, in the sense that not only the, at the presidential level, but all ministries, particularly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense, made uh, declarations supporting the Azerbaijani cause in the Karabakh war. So basically, this is again an exception in the last 30 years uh, Turkish foreign policy as a pattern. So I, I, I don't mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to say that they didn't support it before, but I'm saying that they underlined, they highlighted their support in a very kind of a critical way, in a very kind of a strong emphasis. Even, I mean, uh, even the kind of uh, the representatives of the foreign uh, ministries, they said that they may even act as one state. So it goes beyond the discourse of one nation, two states, and it's more deepened and more pri privileged. I think one of the major reasons why uh, this is more deepened and this is more privileged is actually, again, uh, tied with the Azerbaijani uh, kind of... Um, Azerbaijani success to the restoration and reconsolidation of statehood and nationhood. So basically, uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey in this particular geopolitical context, in this uh, in this kind of a formation of the bilateral relationships, they are equal partners. They are not dependent on each other, and they are mutually dependent on each other. So it's 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 like a kind of an interdependence. So basically, it's, I mean, you will probably remember the early discussions in the early, early independence period that the Turkey provides a role model to the Turkic republics of the former Soviet Union, etc. Well, it wasn't valid at that time anyway, but it's no more valid Turkey and Azerbaijan. Although Turkey is bigger than Azerbaijan in terms of its population, economy, etc., I think they are equal partners and this mutual interdependence and this equal interdependence, actually, provides a good basis for this country to deepen their relations. And uh, finally, and I said that Turkey had a proactive role. It created its own place and status, actually, uh, in a way, overshadowing or undermining the role of European actors, particularly represented in the OSCE uh, Minsk Group, in a way, undermined the role of the EU. And we also mentioned, the other speakers also mentioned the invisibility of the uh, United States in the region due to coronavirus, due to the elections in the United States, etc. Uh, and finally, I think it was a test for Turkish foreign policy to restore or to create its status in the region. So basically, Turkey became a proactive actor, Turkey became a game changer, and it was a test whether it will be able to kind of a, uh, to, to have a great influence in shaping the dynamics within the region. I think, I mean, Turkish foreign policy succeeded quite well in this respect. So the tone has changed, uh, the content is deepened, so the Turkish involvement in the region this way or another will increase. And I guess, I mean, Turks and Azerbaijanis, they share a common memory. I mean, they have this historical memory. Of course, they have similarities, differences, etc. But I think this memory is the memory factor was much more relevant for the Azerbaijani side due to the Turkish support in the early 20th century. Fine. But on the other hand, I think both Turkish political elite and the Turkish public opinion uh, are, are now see, I mean, acknowledge the memory side, shared memory side, and again, shared enemy side as well. But also, I think there is this new concept of shared future. So basically, this is something very new in Turkish public opinion and Turkish political elite discourse. Uh, we actually, in a way, in both parties, took granted the kind of good relations, the privileged relations, the ex ex exceptional relations. But I think 
now both countries they do see that they have to invest more uh, in developing in deepening these type of relationships through, through cultural policies through giant economic projects through probably integrating more georgia into this infrastructural uh, kind of uh, mechanisms or bigger projects. Now, I think, I mean, I, I would say that what has changed is that both countries who used to share the common enemy and common kind of a memory, partly common history now, uh, are willing to share common destiny, common future. I think this is something new on the basis of mutual dependence, interdependence, and on the basis of trust. I think trust issue is very important, particularly um, after Turkey's endeavor, I, I will say, of the normalization of the relationship uh, with Armenia. Uh, this was a project, this was a vision which has failed, uh, obviously, and, uh, and actually I think, uh, and, uh, and obviously violated a little bit the, the, the trust issue in between the countries, and I think this trust is now, this mutual dependence and trust is now restored. So basically, uh, as far as, and, and also kind of, uh, and I think, uh, and to, to conclude, I think that the nature of the relationship between these two countries will be de definitely determine the nature of the ge ge geopolitical or geostrategic um, priorities in the region. Of course, we have the Russian factor. Uh, for the last couple of years, Turkey has good relations with Russia, which is often described as competitive partnership. So in competitive partnership, you have kind of both positive and negative connotations, and I found it quite fragile. So you can compete at some point and then you can collaborate in another, in another point. So I think that this type of, in this type of relationship, interest, ma interest matters, not necessarily trust. So basically, uh, again, in this triangular relationship between Russia, Turkey and Azerbaijan, actually, uh, will be kind of a quite important in shaping the geopolitical uh, priorities uh, in the region. And finally, we have the issue of Armenia uh, in this respect, and then uh, Turkey possible, and because it has, in the last couple of weeks, there are also statements saying that we may even consider, Turkey may even consider to some kind of normalization uh, with Armenia, of course, with the approval uh, and acceptance of the Azerbaijani side, which is quite actually reasonable from my perspective. Uh, but also we have to think, I think, the, the, uh, the, the and we also have to underline the restoration of the Russian factor in the region, in the South Caucasus, this way or another. And I think this kind of uh, creates a sense of fragility. It's a kind of a fragile situation for the preservation of stability and security in the region. So I'm a bit cautious for, on, uh, for the Russian involvement in the region. I think this is what I would say as of now. Yeah. Uh, I will be more thank than happy you. to reply your questions in the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Ayşe Thank you, Dr. Ayşe Ergün, for your comments. The ending of Dr. Svante Cornell's presentation was a little bit uh, scary for me because he focused on <laughs> uh, weakening economy of Turkey, but you seem to focus a lot on a deepening relationship between Turkey and Azerbaijan and focusing on concrete projects. So I think that uh, the situation is not as scary as uh, maybe Dr. Cornell uh, has described it. Uh, but at least in economic sense, Turkey does have certain vulnerabilities. That is true. Um, we have a lot of questions on the chat, but I think most of them focus on uh, the Minsk group, the future of Minsk group, the fate of the Minsk group, uh, whether France deserves a so seat in the Minsk group, whether there is a, a mandate or scope of work for Minsk group to do. So maybe Dr. Uh, Ambassador Breiser will start this discussion because he has served in Minsk group. He knows the dynamics and maybe he can describe us what's going on inside of the Minsk group now. Yeah, thank you so much, Faris. Yeah, um, uh, first of all, uh, as, as terrible as U.S.-Russian relations were in 2008, they were equally positive and collaborative, uh, with regard to Georgia, I mean, they were equally positive and collaborative with regard to Nagorno-Karabakh. And I, I'll never forget having been, yeah, as, as Dr. Cornell said, I was very active with, in U.S. diplomacy during the Russian invasion of Georgia, uh, and a month, a month after the invasion, 
I was at a Minsk group lunch with Foreign Minister Lavrov in Moscow. Uh, and to make a long story short, he made a couple of gestures that made me see, wow, we are, we really are collaborative. We're creative in this Minsk group. And Russia needs to be seen or wants to be seen not as a warmongering country now, but as uh, having a role in the region and, and some sort of a quasi peacemaking role. And so that was the Minsk group was the vehicle for that happening. Um, and we were really were creative, uh, brainstorm with Lavrov, uh, then President Medvedev uh, was also creative and helpful. Um, and so it's, it's a shame that the Minsk group is essentially dead now because that, that's the reality. Um, but it is a very useful forum uh, when, when the co-chairs are behaving in, in, in a objective way. <laughs> and so with France having tilted so dramatically toward Armenia, I, I just can't imagine how the Minsk group can, uh, in its current uh, format, with these three particular co-chairs, who happen to be, by the way, the countries with the three largest Armenian diasporas in the world, um, I don't see how the Minsk group can, can, can do anything constructive now, because it certainly won't be seen and, and will not be de facto uh, objective and impartial. Um, so that leaves the possibility of France being replaced by another Minsk group member state. Uh, couldn't be Turkey, even though Turkey, I know, would, would, would you know, has long and aspire to having a greater role, as I was just saying. Um, but you know, who knows? It could be Germany. It could be the European Commission. Um, and, and and then also the Minsk Group, as we've all been saying, was really hamstrung. And as Dr. Cornell was saying, during in particular during this conflict, it was absent. Uh, and so um, it was actually uh, sad to me. Uh, it was sort of pathetic to see the U.S. and French co-chairs show up in Baku, whenever that was last week, uh, and President Ali have told it like it is, like, why are you here? I didn't ask you to come here. In other words, you did nothing during the conflict. In fact, you were against Azerbaijan. What, what role could you possibly have? And the fact that they showed up without their Russian counterpart present said to me they were sort of angry or, or, or they felt sort of wounded and they were making a statement. They were showing the Russian co-chair, we'll go to Azerbaijan on our own because you went behind our back basically to end the war. Um, so then what, what could the Minsk group do? I don't know. Um, I, I just think in, in general, international regimes or accepted multilateral cooperation bodies are precious <coughs> and need to be uh, nurtured if, if they can survive and if they have a, a, a worthwhile function. So looking into the distant future, I suppose uh, one function could be uh, if there ever is going to be another discussion about the legal status of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and this would be after Armenians would have returned, hopefully feel safe enough, feel there's enough economic opportunity to return, as they started to do, by the way, right after the fighting, right? I mean, tens of thousands of people left on Kendi Stepanakert, Armenians, I mean, and they started streaming back in, right, after the Russian peacekeepers deployed. So once all that um, physical and political and emotional dust settles, uh, maybe it'll be possible to have a, a discussion on legal status. Maybe, maybe Azerbaijan will accept that, uh, wanting to garner as much international goodwill as possible and bury as many of the historical ghosts as possible. And in that case, I suppose the Minsk group could be a useful uh, mediating body, but that's way in the distance for now. I just don't see a role for it. Unfortunately, I say that yeah. painfully. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, interesting analysis. Indeed, it's very difficult to understand what's happening with the Minsk group. We have uh, from Traseco office, uh, uh, Mr. Rufat Bayramov here present. Uh, Traseco, as you know, is a very important project to connect east-west transport corridors. And now that many opportunities open uh, with Nakhchivan and with Turkey, land corridor to Turkey. Rufat, would you like to speak up? Do you want to turn on your microphone and ask your question? And camera as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Faris. Indeed, thank you for this very uh, vivid conversation and uh, the issues that are raised. They are, of course, of very great importance for for our region. And we now see this. Um, I would still say that uh, very fragile piece because uh, I just wanted to make a few comments um, regarding the, the topic, and then I uh, would like to discuss uh, about further uh, developments in our region. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, support uh, one point which was 
it was outlined here that Azerbaijan is one, uh, despite that it's a, it's a very small country uh, in terms of uh, uh, bigger geography, but uh, it is a country that has its own agenda and uh, and especially when we talk about uh, transit routes, uh, about uh, transportation issues, uh, Azerbaijan is turning into an international hub, where, as we see, uh, uh, many international routes are crossing. It's like north, south, east, west, and etc. Traffic, of course, is, is uh, one of the greatest projects which uh, was initiated uh, at the end of. 19th and uh, is still working and struggling to uh, how to say uh, to make this uh, great silk work uh, road uh, one of the uh, let's say most uh, active routes in uh, between Eastbourne and Westbourne. So uh, I want to just to ask Mr. Bryce and maybe other uh, speakers here about. How do they assess this uh, peace? Because we know that uh, Russia has somehow intervened in this process. And uh, the latest statements of Mr. Putin, uh, who is still saying that the status quo should be left uh, till better times, let's say so. And uh, we see the reaction of Armenia, which is also trying to put the status issue of Nagorno-Karabakh as a primary issue for their foreign policy and uh, well, like a topic of further negotiations. And of course, the position as, of Azerbaijan is absolutely different. So we do not accept any any kind of uh, any kind of status for Nagorno-Karabakh because this is international recognized territory of uh, Azerbaijan and uh, the issue was not even discussed before we gained control over the seven districts which are uh, surrounding the Nagorno Karabakh. And okay, now, the, the, now, no, Fad, we, we have we have shortage of time. We are talking about these uh, corridors, which are also, of course, of great importance, and we know that uh, the opening of Nakhchivan Azerbaijan route will uh, will create. Uh, let's say a new opportunity for Turkey um, to transport goods to Central Asia and vice versa, and uh, of course it will uh, contribute to to China's silk road project. Um, so, what is the solution if we see that Minsk Group is dead, let's say in 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 its current state? Uh, who can be? Substituted by France, or I'm, I mean, by whom can France be substituted, and what shall we do all together to okay. make this? Thank, thank you, Rufat. Thank you for your intervention, but we have shortage of time. So uh, the question is about uh, you, you asked a little bit about the mass group, but the bigger question was about the uh, just uh, just solution to the conflict, the fair solution to the conflict. Yes. Um, any of the speakers want to intervene or to, to pick up this question? I think I've maybe, already answered that question. Yeah, maybe I'm Dr. Sure. Svante Cornell, do you want to do you want to give your perspective? Well, first, I think it's going to take a long time before any um, real discussions on this can take place because the process that Armenia is undergoing now is a very profound soul searching i would say uh, i hope they land on the right side of this i don't necessarily have any optimism on that issue but i think what is really needed is a serious process of uh, of of talks that resemble perhaps something like the astana process uh, over syria where you know there's a process in a place that is neutral but that also understands both parties and where uh, People come and meet and they talk and uh, in the beginning they will not do a lot of progress but over time they can deal with practicality, technical issues and now that there is no urgency over a certain period of time they may eventually reach to more serious issues. I think that's what we should work towards. I don't see, I mean this is something the Minsk group could have worked for, I don't see how that's going to happen. Somebody has to take the initiative and uh, I mean, I know that the Kazakhs have volunteered. They would probably be a good um, 
a good choice. I mean, it may be too early, but I think all the surrounding powers should work towards such a process because there are many issues that will arise, many issues that will need to be regulated, whether it have, whether it be about trade, about anything from trade to the final issue of status. Uh, and it's uh, the two parties will have to talk to each other. There, there is a need for a platform. I mean, the Geneva discussions between Russia and Georgia, nobody likes going there. They're not fun. <laughs> Matt can probably tell you about that, but they they fulfill a purpose because there was no other real arena for that type of talks. Uh, so I think something is needed, a long-term process, an ongoing process, a regular process meeting, maybe twice a year or so, uh, but I don't see where it's going to come from at this point. Yes, as a, as a, as a platform, you are right, uh, Dr. Carnell, but on the issue of insisting on the status issue, it seems to me that some Western diplomats retired diplomats, but also even current co-chairs keep insisting on the status issue, where, whereas so many open wounds remain and so much sensitivities is in the region. But I don't understand why they keep pressing on, on the status issue and, and discussing of the status issue. Um, no, no, have... I think that's the final issue at some point in the distant future, but that's uh, that's not an issue for now. That's irrelevant now, actually. Nobody is even interested in talking about it. But I think there are many practical issues uh, from the transportation to the delimitation to uh, peacekeeping to, to many, many, many different questions that will arise during the coming years yeah. that we don't, we're not even thinking about today. Yeah, we have here uh, our staff member, editor, uh, edit, editor of the Baku Dialogues Journal, Damian uh, Kurnevich. Uh, Damian, would you like to ask you a question about the uh, other regional powers such as Iran and Israel? You had a question on that. Go ahead. But we cannot hear you. Can can you turn on your microphone? No, we, we still cannot hear you. Your microphone is off. Uh, th there is a there is a button on the on the screen on the. This is my wife's dream for this to happen to me. <laughs> so I, I think that I think that maybe Damian has a has a technical problem, but he asked a question in the chat about the Iran, whether Iran is a, on a losing side of the balance of power. You know, the, the border has changed with, with Azerbaijan. The um, ethnic Azerbaijanis in Iran are changing their attitude. The trade routes are changing. There's a direct access to Turkey now. So whether Iran is on a losing side, and uh, and also the increasing influence of Israel, maybe. So anyone can comment on this. Maybe Aicha, since you are from Turkey, and we saw a very uh, interesting reaction uh, from Iran to the uh, uh, President Erdogan's speech. Maybe you can comment on this about Iran's position in the balance of power. Well, I'd like to make a short comment on the fate of the possible fate of the Minsk group. Uh, yes. Well, as all of us, I mean, actually, we have been living with, with and within the webinars for the last couple of months. So basically, I, I, I try to focus a little bit on German media, German think tanks, actually, and then reports provided by the uh, German think tanks. It seems that Germany uh, provides, try to present itself in a more neutral position and in a way undermining the France's role in the uh, OSC Minsk group and then arguing that we do not have much bigger Armenian diaspora that we have to kind of uh, take into account. So basically, I think a silent, not visible, but potential candidate in this peace talks process can be Germany. It's, it seems at least uh, this is what they are kind of um, inclined to do. So this is, I mean, I don't have kind of much analytical evidence uh, about this however i mean during the talks and webinars and the publications we can easily i i can easily see that they would like to become a substitute of a trans position in the uh, in the coming or would be post peace talks about the status of the uh, of the result in the resolution of the conflict as for iran so, I mean, uh, the question was whether Iran is a loser in this wider framework of the geopolitical interest in the region. I would like to ask the question of whether Iran was ever a winner in the region. So basically, 
uh, we are actually of yeah we know that there was this obvious support of Iran to Armenia for the last couple of decades. Uh, Turkish are Turkish Iranian relations. They're not necessarily friendly at all. I mean, historically and I mean, currently. So basically, and of course, I mean, although Azerbaijan pursued a rather balanced policy towards Iran due to the fact that there is an extremely significant, effective, I guess, and strong minority of Azerbaijani Turks that uh, I mean, in terms of numbers, they are not minority at all. I think, I mean, the Second Karabakh War and the ethnic Azerbaijani's reaction in living in Iran uh, to the Nagorn, uh, Second Karabakh War and support to army, uh, Azerbaijani people and the state provided a kind of warning for Iran. I mean, actually, by the time there was the street protest by the Azerbaijanis living in Iran, Iran started to make declarations uh, actually supporting the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. Whether it is sincere or not, it's, it's not an issue. So basically, I'm looking at the discourse. So basically, I think uh, not pr probably because of the foreign policy priorities or kind of uh, influence in the region, particularly, particularly in Georgia, both in terms of cultural influence, both in terms of political influence. Iran was never a favorite country uh, not in terms of domestic politics, not only in terms of domestic politics, but also foreign policy priorities too. So basically, uh, I I didn't I and then I never considered Iran as a kind of a very significant factor and actor in shaping the geopolitical dynamics. Uh, but after the Second Karabakh War, due to the uh, significant mi minority living in Iran, I think they will be more cautious in engaging any type of relationship with Armenia in the future. Okay, okay. And in the beginning, thank you, Dr. Aichergun. And uh, I asked a question in the beginning from Ambassador Sh uh, Shafir. Um, I don't know if he's uh, still uh, willing to answer it or not, but my, my main concern was that, you know, the declining uh, influence of the West might eventually put uh, regional countries such as Georgia and Azerbaijan at risk as well. Uh, and whether these small countries will be able to uh, repel the uh, big uh, threats coming from big powers, Ambassador Shafir, what do you what do you think of that? Do you do you want to address it, or do you want to address another question? Go yes, uh, yes. Well, um, let me. Uh, okay, um, I, I noted your your question. There was also a question about the sanctions, and um, so let let me start with the first question. Um, I believe um, the Azerbaijan uh, all these years uh, uh, since independence um, played uh, what is called the game of balance or balancing game quite well and uh, tried to address, uh, first of all, of course, it's uh, tried to pursue its own national interests, but also addressed of the interest of the neighboring countries and the global players. So um, the fact that uh, we see what the West basically has withdrawn from the region, it didn't happen yesterday. So we see that basically from Obama administration. It's all, already 12 years. So the time when the U United States was active in the region, that was the 90s, and maybe another three, four years under Bush administration. And then basically uh, it was, uh, we, we've seen the reduction. But Azerbaijan, definitely, uh, I was at the other webinar. Uh, I think the Swanta was where we uh, we had some uh, some uh, Azerbaijani uh, bureaucrats who also made input, uh, negative input in deterioration of this relationship. But they are now gone. Anyway, the Azerbaijan uh, managed, let's say, to survive, uh, not to survive, but even uh, to foster further in terms of the economy, in terms of the military, and the conditions which you described, the, 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 the gradual decrease of Western powers in the region. So I think that's not the factor. Uh, when you're speaking about um, the, the growing interest or growing power of another, let's say, Russia or whatever, uh, the power, the Azerbaijan has a balance, definitely Turkey is the balance in the region. And this is how Turkey's interest should be considered and Turkey's role should be considered in the region of the South Caucasus. 
balancing power. Um, so whatever is, um, I think the Americans or the European Union, is, I don't know, uh, if they do something <laughs> bad, they, uh, I mean, it's to disconnect their interest. But I, I would like to be a bit optimistic and uh, to see and uh, see maybe more uh, renewed interest on the Biden administration, though they, we know that the uh, traditional Democrats are closer to to ethnic lobbies in the United States. Um, and But uh, we'll see. I mean, it's hard to predict. Probably the, the ambassador Bryza knows much better uh, from Washington what's going on and what will happen in the uh, in U.S. policy in the South Pops in the Middle East. But uh, that comes to the question of the sanctions, and I don't think, uh, again, uh, not maybe fully qualified to answer uh, the question about American possible sanctions, but I don't think uh, the American Biden administration will enact any sanction against Azerbaijan. The, okay. the of U.S. Uh, sanctions on Turkey, mm, uh, on Azerbaijan, I don't think so. Um, uh, Turkey basically also, I mean, in terms of the military, uh, the Turkey is finding some replacement. But economic situation, yes, it might be um, some uh, some implications. But uh, Azerbaijan economy, uh, uh, I would say, will be hit uh, or uh, if next year not because of uh, Turkish economy. Uh, I think the, the first factor is the COVID-19 crisis. That yes. The, 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 yes. The big and yes, then the just... situation in Russia and then in, in Turkey, so that's what will be compounding factors of in terms of the sanctions. Yes. And also the part question with regard to EU sanctions, uh, you know, just a few hours ago, the, the German Minister of Foreign Affairs he uh, said that uh, Germany is not going to approve any sanctions against Turkey. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Shafiev. I, I think that uh, you raised a very interesting perspective on economic issues. And Azerbaijan has just announced there will be increase uh, in the military budget by almost 800 million. Uh, and there's also 2.2 uh, a billion uh, manat, which will be going directly to the reconstruction work. So I think these are important numbers to keep in mind. One final question to our panelists before we wrap up the first day of discussions is whether this uh, situation in Nagorno-Karabakh has any implications for other regional conflicts, meaning in Georgian territory, in Moldova, which I know uh, I now I now can see that newly elected a Moldovan president is demanding Russian troops to be out or even maybe for Ukraine. Is there any parallels to draw between these conflicts? We start with Ambassador Bryza and then we take sure. very short answers from others as well. Sure, I think already we're seeing in Georgia some signs of uh, impact, which is that Russia is actually tightening the screws on the Abkhaz and making it sound more and more like Russia is now going to integrate Abkhazia into the Russian Federation, or at least that's its ambition. And in my experience mediating that conflict, um, the Abkhaz, and, and as Fante knows well, they, they, they were uh, quite uh, intense about not wanting to be swallowed up by Russia. Uh, so that's one impact. And I think a second impact is a bit more derivative, but it's Turkey and Ukraine. And as, as people have in Washington and Paris elsewhere have leaned on, on Turkey and criticized it, we've seen uh, agreements between uh, President Erdogan, President Zelensky, to increase military technological cooperation. So Ukraine is going to buy uh, naval corvettes from Turkey. They've already bought uh, Bayraktar UAVs. They're going to buy more of them. Uh, and then both countries are talking about jointly developing a jet engine. So, uh, and, and, and I mean, Ukraine is a potent force in engineering and, and military uh, technological developments. Thanks. And I might. He's on the move. Uh, well, there's the pro there's the problem with internet connection, of course, everywhere in the world. But uh, do do other panelists want to address this issue as well? I know Dr. Swante has a lot of experience in Georgian conflicts. Well, I think I I will make one major point. I think, which is that the big difference between the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict and all the others was always that Russia is not a direct party. 
Um, so whatever Russians, Moldovans or Georgians are going to do to change the status quo, that runs up directly against Russia, which means it's an immediate challenge to President Putin's authority. Uh, whereas in this conflict, Putin could shrug his shoulder and say, well, you know what, guys, whatever, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's what the Armenians found to be so surprising, although, of course, for, for years we had seen the signs on the wall that Russia was playing both sides, as, by the way, it was in, in the actual war. Uh, we shouldn't forget that. So I think that's the big difference. So therefore, I think that the implications will be limited. But the, the real implication is that at, at one the, the, uh, let's put it this way. If the conditions are right, you can get your territory back. I think that's the big lesson. And I think yeah, that is what that is what Ukrainian friends were telling me that, you know, they are now uh, very optimistic that eventually they will be able to get their land back as well. This is this is what they were honestly telling me. Um, dear colleagues, we have, we are wrapping up the first day of discussions. Uh, we will have some more speakers tomorrow. And uh, we will have interesting perspectives uh, from, uh, you know, uh, other countries such as Georgia, Pakistan. Uh, we will have uh, some uh, think tank representatives uh, from uh, Washington. So I invite all the participants to join tomorrow at the same time. Uh, hopefully the Internet problems will not deter us from interesting discussions. We have time for. So today we are continuing our excellent discussions. And we have another excellent panel of people who are very much specializing in the region. They know a lot of details. They know a lot of uh, nuances. And it is my great honor to introduce them. But before that, I will say that once again, I will remind that this event is jointly co-organized by ADA University and um, University of Cambridge, University of Kent, our British partners, which we have for the last several years within the COMPASS research project. So special thanks to our partners and huge thanks to our panelists. I will introduce them to you today. They will make introductory remarks around seven to eight minutes about the Second Karabakh conflict, its con consequences for the regional security, it is uh, consequences for the international actors. So, uh, and after that, we can have some time for discussion. Today in our second panel, we have um, various perspectives. We have American perspectives, Georgian perspectives. We have a speaker, very excellent speaker from Pakistan, as well as our own Dr. Anar Valiyev from uh, School of Public and International Affairs of ADA University, who will also give you Azerbaijani perspective. First, I want to turn the floor to our Georgian colleague, um, Dr. Mamuka Tsereteli. He is a long time friend of our university. We have done many projects together. And he, uh, of course, will discuss both Georgian perspective, but also Western perspective because he is based at um, uh, in United States. Uh, he's a senior fellow at Central Asia Caucasus Institute, um, uh, which is based at um, American Foreign Policy uh, Center. And uh, he will give us perspective, which we rarely hear, which is Georgian perspective and also Western perspective to the recent events. And then I will introduce other speakers as well. Dr. Tsereteli, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, dear Faris, everybody. Uh, nice to see you. Well, nice to see all friends. And uh, uh, welcome every, everyone for this important and timely discussion about uh, consequences uh, for uh, larger region of this recent uh, outcome of the conflict. and. Uh, I uh, would like to uh, would like to try to cover a few items in an introductory uh, introductory remarks, and then hopefully we'll have some time for discussions. Obviously, the uh, conflict uh, uh, and outcome of the uh, conflict, military conflict uh, uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, made significant changes in the picture of the geopolitical picture of the wider Black Sea Caspian region. Uh, what demonstrated that uh, power politics is alive and well and that with great power consent uh, and in some cases great power assistance small actors in this case azerbaijan can achieve their national objectives with uh, military means more efficiently than with uh, diplomatic means russia by maintaining uh, neutrality in this conflict uh, uh, obtained some additional leverage in the caucasus uh, with uh, further increasing armenia's security dependence on russia 
uh, but also with some additional military presence in, in different parts of the Caucasus and most mostly obviously in, in uh, what we call Upper Karabakh. Turkey now has a, a greater role in this uh, in the Caucasus affairs, uh, but it's no longer seen as a necessarily the channel of Western interest in the region, but rather representing its own national interest. The way President Erdogan and its its partners and uh, allies, uh, domestic allies, understand it. I think yesterday Ambassador uh, Medvedev uh, mentioned uh, that uh, uh, presence of uh, Turkish troops in Azerbaijan is the presence of NATO in Azerbaijan. I would be a little cautious about this uh, this statement. It's mostly, I think, uh, Turkey as a Turkey, not Turkey as a NATO ally. Obviously, there is a uh, there may be uh, some. Um, interpretation of this and we can discuss it later if, if, if possible. As a result, we are moving towards a new status quo in the uh, South Caucasus, which is still shaping up with different actors facing different challenges as well as opportunities. Georgia will be impacted uh, by this outcome of the war uh, in multiple ways and the country will need to strategy, new strategy, I would say, to adapt to these new realities take into, into consideration gains and losses of the parties uh, actively involved uh, in the conflict, as well as this post-conflict development. I think Azerbaijan achieved significant military victory and territorial gains, probably more than it ever ha hoped to achieve at the negotiation table. Seven regions outside of Nagorno-Karabakh, previously occupied by Armenia, went uh, back to Azerbaijani control. And uh, this uh, includes the entire length of the Azerbaijan-Iranian border, which is important on the south, regions between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, except five kilometer wide trans uh, transportation link that connects Lachin Corridor. About one third of the region, uh, formerly called Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast in Soviet times, will also be under Azerbaijani control, including the uh, town of Shusha, a medieval citadel that almost uh, which has very important, obviously, cultural, historical importance um, for the region. I would like to uh, maybe uh, say a few words about uh, uh, some cost that is associated with this uh, military victory. Azerbaijan had to agree to delegate part of its sovereign uh, rights to the uh, Russian military over some parts of uh, the Yuri Azerbaijani territory. The majority of the uh, uh, up, up Karabakh, former Nagorno-Karabakh, will remain under Armenian control, secured by Russian military peacekeepers. The access road via Lachin from Armenia to Armenian-controlled territories of Karabakh will also be under Russian control. In addition, one important segment of the November 9 trilateral agreement between Armenia, Azerbaijan and Russia is that border troops of the Russian security forces, FSB, will be in charge of safety of the access from Azerbaijan to Nakhichevan via Armenia. Uh, the agreement, by the way, doesn't specify size and operational modalities of uh, those troops. Uh, all these elements of engagement of the Russian military are somewhat gains for Russian Federation and uh, uh, geopolitical consequences of this, this, uh, of this uh, probably remains to be seen and understood going forward. Meanwhile, uh, Azerbaijan uh, at this stage clearly wants to work with Russia to achieve what it considers a priority national objective. This sends a pretty good message from the Russian perspective. If you have good, uh, have better chance, you have better chance to be successful in the conflict if you are on good terms with Russia. This contrasts with the Western effort of mediation, which has not delivered any meaningful results for Azerbaijan for three decades. As a result, positive outcome of the war, which should not be, uh, I would say Russia, with this, Russia has some positive outcome of the war, which shouldn't be exaggerated, but cannot be disregarded as well. Russia is back in a role of arbiter and peacekeeper in the Azerbaijan-Armenian conflict with the ability to change status quo again in the future at its discretion. Most importantly, uh, with its peacekeeping role in conflict, the uh, necess necessity, to, necessity to keep uh, logistical and supply lines open, Russia is establishing long-term military presence in the region. Additional one, and, uh, and, and definitely first time since the independence of Azerbaijan on the Euro azerbaijani territory. Uh, military defeat obviously caused significant internal turmoil uh, in Armenia, and I will not spend too much time on that, but clearly, uh, 
uh, to the extent that uh, these um, developments uh, could play the, uh, the role in the in the future of the region. I think it will play, uh, in a sense, outcome of the war as a reminder uh, for everybody who is Russian Russian ally that as long as you are Russian ally, uh, you have to be more loyal to Russian interests and uh, less independent minded. Really, that's a, that's a message. Uh, meanwhile, Turkey moved uh, farther away from the role of uh, just a challenge, challenge channel of Western interests uh, and the, uh, to the role of pursuing sovereign Turkish interests in the South Caucasus and wider Black Sea Caspian region. Turkey is very happy with the outcome of the war, as President Erdogan has stated many times. Uh, if all the points of the agreement are implemented, Turkey may have short access to mainland Azerbaijan via Armenia, hypothetically leading to normalization of relationships uh, and the opening of the border with Armenia as well down the road in the future, which has been uh, President Erdogan's objective for some time. Due to this interest, it appears Turkey is not overly concerned with Russian peacekeeping presence in Azerbaijan. Uh, the war and trilateral agreement between Armenia, Azerbaijan and Russia is a major diplomatic failure to, uh, for the West. Uh, the absence of uh, the US and Europe, as well as OSC Minsk Group, from the process of negotiations uh, of the modalities of this peace agreement demonstrated that uh, international framework for conflict settlement was replaced by de facto Turkey-Russia Turkey format. And co-chairs of the OSC Minsk Group uh, in charge of the conflict, France and uh, the US, we are completely ignored by the third co-chair of the group, Russia, when organizing and signing this agreement. The West and NATO were also ignored by Turkey, uh, by NATO ally Turkey, which provided support to Azerbaijan without consulting uh, with NATO partners. The, the diminishing role of Western institutions in developments in the Russian neighborhood was Russia's interest for more than two decades. So that's uh, another um, six, uh, probably positive for Russia in this picture. All these factors lead to new geopolitical realities in Georgia's neighborhood, which is in turn uh, creating new challenges as well as some opportunities for Georgia. The most obvious challenge is that uh, increased, uh, increased presence, presence of Russian of military uh, in the region and the uh, fact that uh, this military will need some, uh, again, supply lines to be open, logistical support. We also know that uh, parties of the conflict, both Armenia and Azerbaijan, asked the Georgian government to open uh, air um, access uh, to airspace uh, for um, transportation of peacekeeping forces via Georgian airspace. Most probably this type of request will be coming in the future, and Georgia has to have a clear strategy how to deal with, uh, uh, with this uh, military uh, movements of military requests, movements of mili Russian military on, on Georgia, over Georgian airspace, maybe on the, over the land as well, down the road. Another challenge is that uh, uh, this is more uh, down the road and uh, more distant, but uh, there needs to be clarity in the uh, uh, new, um, how this new transportation links between Azerbaijan and Armenia will impact Georgia, Georgian ports, access to Black Sea and, and so forth. Uh, probably more immediate, uh, by the way, we can elaborate on this subject uh, at the Q&A session. And uh, another very important uh, challenge for Georgia is a pressure, uh, new renewed pressure on Abkhazian leadership, uh, separatist uh, regime in Abkhazia on Russian side to try to uh, uh, benefit from the fears that Abkhazians may have in the, uh, after the conflict and, and consequences of the conflict. Uh, after the meeting, uh, uh, Russian President Putin, uh, de facto uh, leader of uh, Abkhazian separatist regime, Mr. Vjani, announced that uh, there will be uh, greater economic integration of Abkhazia with uh, uh, with the uh, Russian Federation, which uh, in a sense uh, reflects a uh, process of de facto annexation of Abkhazia and acceleration maybe of the process, which has obviously creates challenges to, uh, to Georgia. Responding to this and other national, uh, national security challenges, uh, 
clearly Georgia needs to reevaluate its national security strategy. I have some uh, ideas and thoughts about that. Uh, talking about very briefly uh, about uh, the transportation uh, links and uh, and uh, uh, partnerships with the strategic allies uh, like uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan. I think it's essential to understand, uh, uh, have the same degree of understanding, and I, I repeat this frequently, as, as, as these three countries had during the development of energy corridor in uh, early 2000, late 90s, early 2000s, so that parties are on the same page on, on understanding of, uh, of the processes that are taking place in terms of not only energy transit, but also general cargo transportation. So without going into details of uh, my recommendations for uh, Georgia's strategy uh, uh, responding to this uh, to this conflict, maybe I'll stop here and if there yes. is the opportunity going thank forward. You, thank you, we'll thank you so later. much, Dr. Mamuka Tsereteli. I was just listening this morning to president of Georgia uh, who was saying that, you know, um, Georgia uh, wants to offer itself as a platform for negotiations for neutral territory. And also she said something about uh, Georgia willing to join Caucasian Caucasus platform. Not sure what she's specifically referring to, whether this is Caucasus platform, which is sort of suggested by Erdogan and Aliyev. But anyway, it's good to hear your perspective and we will come back to the role of Georgia in in few minutes. Now I would like to introduce uh, one of the two uh, great speakers from Washington who have joined us, uh, think tanks, various think tanks. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Mike Michael Doran. Uh, he is a good friend of ours and he uh, works at Hudson Institute as a senior fellow. Um, uh, Michael Doran, uh, thank you very much for joining our panel. It would be great to hear your perspective, uh, especially because of the fact that you have paid a lot of attention to this conflict recently. So please, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is give you my personal views um, and then distinguish those from uh, other people in Washington uh, to get a sense of the, the, the debate here. Um, I, I look at the world uh, uh, personally from the point of view that the primary interest of the United States is to uh, contain uh, or weaken Russia and Iran. Uh, uh, with a strong emphasis on I Iran. Um, and the rise of Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijani power, I think is a tremendous asset uh, to the United States and to the West. Um, and uh, I see this war um, not as just a, a simple event, but as part of a really significant historical transformation in the region. Uh, we haven't seen uh, Russia sharing power in the Caucasus, in the South Caucasus, uh, for 100 years. Um, and even really, I mean, more like 150 years, really. Uh, so this is a really very significant um, uh, event. And 10 or 15 years ago in, in Washington, I think it would have been universally regarded uh, in, in that way. Uh, uh, I think that my thinking about these things is sort of traditional, uh, but the United States is shifting um, toward what? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll get back to that um, uh, in a minute. Uh, what strikes me, um, I'm, I am, uh, traditionally I'm a Middle East expert. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Caucasus, um, but I started to get more and more interested because uh, the definition between Middle East and Caucasus is really becoming very blurred. Um, I came at this primarily as somebody who's interested in Iran. Um, and the thing that strikes me about um, Azerbaijan uh, is that uh, for a small country, it has an enormous influence, um, much beyond uh, its size. It's deceptively influential. I think a lot of Americans are not aware of that. Uh, but with uh, uh, between 20 and 30 million South Azerbaijanis in Iran, um, uh, two million plus Azerbaijanis in um, uh, in Russia, um, and then in addition, an enormous influence in in, in Turkey, uh, which I don't think has been 
people have really, uh, in, in America, I don't think they've really thought about it in these terms at all. Uh, I was in Azerbaijan uh, at the end of the war. Uh, I came through Turkey. I was really struck when I was in Turkey, wa just watching the news and talking to people. The news reported Azerbaijani victories as our victories. You know, we, we, uh, we, uh, we took a drought. Uh, that's how they're they're referring to it, um, and that's not coming that's not coming from the government down to the people, as far as I can tell. That's from the people up to the um, uh, up to the government. The um, so uh, there's a enormous um, uh, you know enormous identification in the Turkish population with uh, with Azerbaijan with the Azerbaijani cause. So that gives a that gives a relatively small country. This great purchase on public opinion in, in Iran, great purchase on public opinion in um, uh, in Russia and also in, in Turkey. Um, and that's aside from the fact I'm sure that uh, my colleague Luke will uh, Luke Coffey will talk about the uh, the energy corridor. I won't say much about that, but this is the only corridor, uh, the only uh, corridor through which uh, uh, energy is moving from Asia to Europe that isn't under the control of the Russians. Um, it was remarkable to me to see that at a time when the United States is um, is having a significant conflict with its European allies about Nord Stream 2 uh, in order uh, 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 on the argument that the uh, German Russian energy relations were undermining energy security in Europe, uh, they were largely asleep about the uh, about Azerbaijan and the threat to energy security to Europe that the uh, Armenian-Russian alliance uh, represented. Um, now, that's how I see it. I see a, a major structural shift uh, in the Caucasus. I think that this uh, corridor across uh, Nakhchivan is of world historical significance because we're now talking about a really a Turkic corridor all the way from Turkey uh, to, um, to Xinjiang in China. So the, when we're at a, at a time when the United States is, is, is telling itself that it's in a geostrategic competition with China um, and is telling itself that it no longer can carry the burden of military action all over the world, the rise of a power like Azerbaijan, particularly in alliance with Turkey and NATO partner, seems to me to be a godsend to the United States. But that's not the way it's being interpreted um, uh, among a lot of significant elements in Washington. Uh, and that's what's really uh, shocking. The, um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, America is becoming um, uh, increasingly parochial. And I, I, don't know, I don't know if this is a glitch uh, that's going to last for five, seven years, or, uh, and then we'll return to um, a, a, a United States that has a greater sort of um, geostrategic perspective, or if if we've now taken a turn in history and we're going to see a more parochial uh, um, America, but uh, you know it was particularly the the parochialism of the United States, and by that I mean just uh, a United States that's uh, that is really concerned with its just with itself, its own internal uh, uh, processes. That was, of course, exacerbated by the by the election. This is a particularly contentious election, the most contentious election of my lifetime, I think. Um, uh, and uh, uh, people were focused on that. But a, a number of voices in Washington were making arguments that I had never heard before um, or, 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 or hadn't heard to the same degree. One was uh, the notion that the, the United States has to be concerned about Christian powers. Uh, this is uh, this is something that uh, I never heard people really argue um, in uh, 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 outside of you know outside of churches um, and in more parochial settings. I never heard people making the argument the United States needs to identify with Christian powers. Um, another one was uh, which is related was that there was a um, a tendency to discount Azerbaijan because of the hostility toward Turkey. Uh, in 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 Washington, uh, the U.S.-Turkish relations are at a uh, historic low point. Whether they're at the low point now or they're coming out of the low point, I don't know. But the, they've been historically bad. Uh, and uh, Donald Trump, of course, was um, uh, more sympathetic to Turkey than just about anyone else in the government. 
Uh, and that exacerbated the problem in a certain way because people who were opposed to Trump then had a tendency to exact to um, uh, to criticize Turkey more because it was an indirect way of getting at Trump. Um, whether how much of that how much of that hostility to Turkey was hostility to Trump, uh, I don't know. But some significant portion of it is just a hostility to Turkey, and that carried over into Azerbaijan. I found it so surprising when I had to argue with colleagues. Um, who were adamant about denying the strategic benefits to the United States um, of the rise of Azerbaijan uh, because because of the Turkey factor. Um, and um, I think maybe um, I'll stop at this point and, and yes. pass it over to Luke. I'll just I'll just uh, say one last thing. It's that where all how all of this is going to work itself out over time is 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 very unclear. Um, we need to see how the Biden administration starts to interpret these things. But the initial uh, the initial signals that we're getting from the Biden team um, don't make me more optimistic. I'll just I'll just yeah. say there and that's an understatement, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Michael Doran. Thank you very much for your perspective and thanks for visiting Azerbaijan. Um, I know that many people now started talking after this war about the concept of middle power in yesterday's session, we had a lot of people referring to Azerbaijan as middle power, um, not necessarily because of its size, but perhaps of its diplomatic relationships. Now Azerbaijan is chairing non-aligned movement, which is a big group of uh, powerful uh, uh, network of countries. Um, now you have already passed the floor to Luke. Let me introduce him. Uh, Mr. Luke uh, Kofi is also joining us from Washington. He's at another very important think tank, which is Heritage Foundation. Um, he has uh, shocked Azerbaijanis and regional experts uh, during the war by his active uh, presence in social media, by his active analysis. He was visible everywhere. He was present. So, uh, Mr. Luke Kofi, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, for the participants, I will say that Mr. Luke Kofi is the director of the Foreign Policy Studies uh, at uh, Heritage uh, Foundation and uh, frequent uh, prolific writer on uh, our region as well. So the floor is yours, Mr. Kofi. Thank you, Faris, uh, for that very kind introduction and for inviting me to speak here today. And also thanks to ADA and all the sponsors for putting together this event. Um, I was I'm very I was very jealous of, of Mike. Uh, you talk about social media, but when Mike was you know going around as my John at such a crucial and historical moment, I was very jealous myself. Uh, before the pandemic, the last time I flew on a plane and my last time overseas was actually to Baku in February, late February. Um, and who would have guessed how much the world would have changed since that last uh, last time that I myself was on a plane. Um, but uh, I hope to get back to uh, Azerbaijan as soon as the, and of course, my, of course, Georgia as well. I love, you know, I love both of the countries very much. Uh, the people, the culture, the food, uh, the history. So I hope to get back to the region uh, as soon as the um, the pandemic allows, or, or I should say my wife and family allows. <laughs> so, sure. um, anyway, I wanted to focus my, um, my two, uh, or I want to focus on two issues. Um, we've, we've already heard a great overview from Amuka on the implications for the region, especially from a, a Georgia point of view. Um, we've heard from Mike uh, the the U.S. Uh, mood and how American policymakers and commentators view the conflict. I want to um, take Mike's uh, comments uh, to the to the next uh, stage and talk about practical ways that the U.S. and Azerbaijan can improve their bilateral relationship. And then also, I want as an outsider, as a foreigner, as an American, I would like to offer my uh, brief views, uh, if I may, on some of the challenges I see for Azerbaijan um, in the near future uh, as a result of their success on the battlefield. So the first thing the United States should do is simply show up to the region, right? Um, the last time uh, a cabinet secretary has visited Baku was Hillary Clinton in 2012. Of course, uh, John Bolton visited as National Security Advisor in 2018, but we've had no cabinet-level secretary visit uh, in almost a decade now to Baku. Um, Tbilisi's received a little bit more love, but not that much. It needs more love, too. Um, 
So the first thing the U.S. needs to do is show up. Um, in addition to showing up, we need to uh, look for opportunities to increase our diplomatic presence, to show a U.S. presence on the ground and to have an American flag flying. And one uh, idea that I've thrown out there in the past was the U.S. should um, consider, of course, in consultation with, with Azerbaijan, it goes without saying, but should consider uh, opening a consulate in Ganja. Um, this makes perfect sense because of Ganja's important uh, role in uh, inter regional energy transportation, re regional trade, economic activity, its cultural importance, and the fact that it is the second largest city in Azerbaijan. Um, so I think uh, the U.S. should uh, start engaging in some sort of talks about uh, this possibility. Um, the third thing I think the U.S. should do in this um, new environment with Azerbaijan is uh, get Azerbaijan more included and factored into America's Central Asian strategy. Um, back in February, the Trump administration launched a very comprehensive uh, Central Asian strategy. Um, it really built on the last uh, strategy that was published, I think, in 2014 or 2015. And I really hope that the next administration, you know, keeps the strategy because I, there's nothing partisan about it. It's very sound in terms of U.S. strategic interests. The one thing that was missing in the strategy was any meaningful mention of the importance of the Caspian to Central Asia and specifically Azerbaijan. I mean, the word Azerbaijan is not found in the in the strategy at all. And as um, as we all know, looking at a map, uh, you can't um, enter Central Asia without first going through Azerbaijan, um, if you want to avoid Russia or Iran, right? So that's why we need to figure out a way we can get Azerbaijan more um, linked and intertwined into America's Central Asian strategy. And one way to do this, one proposal I've had is um, perhaps create a C5 plus two format. Um, so the C5 plus one, of course, uh, um, in, in case uh, some of the participants don't know, was this format created in the um, final days of the Obama administration where um, the U.S. would meet with the um, each Central Asian Republic all at the same time. I mean, there was this view, it's slowly changing, but there was this view in Washington that if you meet with one, you have to meet with all, all five, otherwise one of them gets upset or whatever. I think that's changed with Pompeo's visit to uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And I think that's good. I think we have to be adults about this. Um, it can't always be equal. We can't pretend that America's relationship with Kazakhstan is the same as with Turkmenistan, for example, right? Um, so maybe have a, a, a session at the end of the C5 plus one, where it's the C5 plus two, where you have Azerbaijan at the table and you have the US Central, the five Central Asian republics and, and Azerbaijan working and talking and coordinating on shared uh, regional uh, interests. So I think that's a practical way the U.S. can um, include Azerbaijan more into its Central Asian uh, strategy. Um, it, along the same lines, the U.S. should start um, having a discussion or start considering uh, maybe the creation of a Four Seas initiative, right? The Three Seas Initiative um, already exists. Uh, for those who don't know, the Three Seas Initiative is a, is a collection of 12 European Union member states in Eastern Europe that have um, that, that share a border with the Baltic, Adriatic, and Black Seas. Um, in my opinion, this should be expanded to non-EU countries in the Balkans and also with uh, with Georgia and Ukraine, I mean, how do you have this sort of initiative to improve regional infrastructure and regional trade and regional energy uh, cooperation without including Ukraine or including Georgia or some of the Western Balkans? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but I'm not saying we need to do this now because we're still working on the three C's, but maybe in the future there's scope for a four C's to include the Caspian. Because again, the, the energy infrastructure, the uh, regional trade, the east-west flow of goods includes the Caspian, and you have to factor in a country like Azerbaijan into this. Um, now, turning a bit more to the, the military side of things and security, the fifth um, 
recommendation I would have to improve U.S. Azerbaijani relations is to continue to provide military assistance to all deserving countries in the region. The decision for the U.S. to provide any military assistance or help should be based solely on U.S. national security interests and not on emotional appeals from certain diaspora and lobbyist groups. Um, and we all, <laughs> Mike's laughing. Yeah. Uh, we have to look at this from what is in America's interest, right? And uh, certainly as for the reasons Mike pointed out, um, continuing U.S. sized by Johnny security sector cooperation and military cooperation um, not only benefits the U.S. and Azerbaijan, but also, I think, uh, the broader region. Now, along the same lines of military cooperation, there's another aspect where I think the U.S. can play a role, and that um, that is uh, on um, treating and helping uh, your wounded warriors convalesce and get better, and especially on the mental health side of things. Uh, you know, I saw on social media um, a lot of talk about you know, the the TB2 drones and the Israeli drones won the war. You know, I'll tell you what won a war. You can go on Telegram or some of these other outlets and you can see some of the heroic footage of capturing Shusha, boots on the ground, taking objectives. That won the war. Your soldiers on the ground won the war. And they're going to, many of them will be scarred. Uh, mentally. And this is something that we have uh, learned to deal with effectively, I think, in the U.S. I mean, there's still room for improvement. It's estimated that in America, every single day, around 20 veterans commit suicide every single day. Um, so this is something that Azerbaijan and Armenia is going to have to deal with. And this is something that the U.S. can work with both countries on. Um, to, so both can learn from from our uh, our experiences on treating wounded warriors and uh, especially on the mental health side of things. And finally, the seventh thing, the seventh uh, idea is, and this is my final one. I know people are probably getting bored at this point. The the seventh point is the U.S. needs to play some sort of leadership role in encouraging some sort of confidence building. Uh, regional infrastructure project. I don't know what this could be. I've thrown out a few ideas. Uh, some people like them. Some people quickly shoot them down on social media. For sake of time, I'm not going to go into them here. But there needs to be a way to get, you know, to build the peace, to get Armenia, uh, when when the time is right, more involved and interconnected in, in the region. Um, and maybe the U.S. can play a role in that. Now, uh, that's about U.S. Uh, Azerbaijan bilateral relations. In terms of um, challenges for Azerbaijan going forward, I'll briefly focus on three. And the first one is Azerbaijan somehow at least needs to try to create the conditions that would allow the Russian peacekeepers to leave after five years when the man first mandate ends. I'm not holding my breath. You look at places like uh, Shkinvali or Abkhazia, Transnistria, um, it's likely that these Russian peacekeepers are going to be here there for a while. But the government needs to at least try to create a exit plan, a path out for Russian peacekeepers. And they need to start working now with trying to float the idea of, in 2025, transitioning the Russian peacekeeping force to a civilian monitoring mission. This could be similar to the European Union monitoring mission in Georgia. Does it have to be provided by the EU? It won't be exactly like that. But this monitoring mission that shows transparency, it shows that, um, that there aren't uh, violations of, uh, at least from in the case of Georgia, on the Georgian side, there are no violations of the ceasefire agreement. Of course, in Georgia, uh, Russia refuses to allow the monitors on the occupied regions. Um, but Azerbaijan should be working with the OSCE, with the European Union, consulting with key uh, interlocutors in Europe and also in America on trying to pave the way for this sort of transition. And they should be very open with Moscow about it. Um, they should say, hey, we, you know, we want to give you a way out of this uh, as well. Again, I'm not, I'm not optimistic about this. I'm not holding my breath. But Azerbaijan needs to at least try to, to make this happen. And this could actually be a new task for the Minsk group. People are wondering, what's the point of the Minsk group right now? Um, 
And, you know, maybe this could be the, 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 new, the new challenge. The second one is uh, the second challenge for Azerbaijan is um, to demonstrate sovereignty in any way possible it can, especially in the regions under the protection of the Russian peacekeepers. Um, this means that there are any official buildings, the Azerbaijani flag should be the flag flying. Um, the Manat should be um, the, the currency. Uh, on the Lachin corridor, the, the bit that's patrolled by where the security is provided by Russian peacekeepers in, in Lachin, um, there should be some sort of agreement maybe where uh, the law enforcement, like the traffic control, is done by Azerbaijan. Um, so any that's going to be a big challenge, but Azerbaijan needs to look for opportunities and ways to show sovereignty where it can. And then finally, um, the, this is going to be a big challenge, I think, for the government is to manage everyone's expectations. De uh, the, the, the British just finally demined the Falkland Islands in September. And that war was in 1982, and it was a very short war. Um, of course, the Falkland Islands are a lot different. They're, you know, thousands of miles away in the South Atlantic and not very many people live there and they could take their time. But demining takes a long time and then rebuilding takes a long time and it takes a lot of money. And you have, uh, you know, about 700,000 people who want to reasonably want to go back to their old homes. So um, the, the government is going to have to do a, 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 a balancing act on the, the desires and the legitimate needs with these people wanting to go home with the reality on the ground. And uh, I could see that being a potential problem, uh, a domestic problem, the social unrest. Uh, so those are the three challenges. Um, so I gave seven ideas for U.S. Yes. Azerbaijani relations, and I gave my views on three challenges for Azerbaijan going forward. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Luke Poppy, and thank you again to Mike Doran. We have excellent perspective from Washington. Uh, and some of the things you mentioned, look, is very, they are very important. I mean, challenges of repatriation, challenge of reconstruction, uh, we face it, challenge of also for peacekeepers and, and, and the uh, territories that are still uh, under their, con their monitoring or their control. So though these issues are very challenging. Now, government of Azerbaijan announced 2.2 uh, billion manat for the next year budget for reconstruction. So hopefully some initial works will start already. Roads are being built and electric lines are being uh, fixed. So um, now we have um, we, we will shift our perspective. Uh, we always have in Azerbaijan a lot of Western perspective, but it is important to have um, also Eastern perspective, uh, perspective from Asia and spe specifically from a country which is so close to Azerbaijan politically, militarily. Uh, we have excellent uh, uh, partner presenter uh, from Pakistan. He is a, a good friend of our university as well as his institution. I, uh, I will introduce Dr. Mahmoud Ul Hassan Khan. He is the director of geopolitics uh, at the Defense Journal in Pakistan, also working at the uh, Pakistani uh, Center for Global and Strategic Studies, our partner institution. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hassan, uh, uh, Mahmoud Hassan Khan, the floor is yours, please. Uh, we would love to hear your perspective as well. Uh, please turn on your microphone because we cannot hear you. Yeah. OK, now we can hear you. OK. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to express my expertise on uh, the given topic of today. So my uh, 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 speech uh, uh, will be focused uh, on winner and loser of Azerbaijan Armenian war. So lots of uh, previous speakers have already spoken about the, the, the socio-economic, geopolitical or geostrategic uh, importance of the victory of Azerbaijan. So I will also extend uh, on these uh, lines. Uh, dreams come true and miracle happens in South Caucasus. The Republic of Azerbaijan has no succeeded to liberate its illegally occupied territory from the uh, from Armenia. There are certain winners and losers. Uh, no uh, geography, economy, social fabric, uh, national politics, geopolitics, 
and your strategic realities have been dr drastically changed. But unfortunately, uh, previously complex and complicated regional and international power dynamics could not resolve the issue which has been swinging between frozen <clears throat> and diplomatic uh, efforts uh, for the last uh, 29 to 30 years. It is indeed a great geopolitical victory for Azerbaijan, which has further enhanced Turkish footprint in the region, starting from Qatar in 2017, Libya in 2019, and of course, Azerbaijan in 2020. All opted for Ankara as a friend, as a strategic ally. Azerbaijan achieved significant uh, military victory and territorial gains more than it ever hoped to achieve at the negotiating table. Seven region outside the Nagorno-Karabakh, previously uh, occupied by Armenia, has now been granted back to Azerbaijani control. This is, includes the entire length of Azerbaijan-Iranian border in the south and regions between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh and also included the uh, Nakhchivan, the Lachin Corridor, about one third of the region called Goro Karabakh uh, uh, regions uh, will also be handed over to uh, Azerbaijan authorities. This military success will help um, His Excellency President of Ilham Alif to further consolidate uh, his power domestically, regionally, and internationally, particularly in the wider Black Sea Caspian region. Meanwhile, Turkey moved further away from the role of channel of Western interest to the role of pursuing uh, sovereign Turkish interest in South Caucasus and wider Black Sea Caspian Sea. Uh, so I heard uh, one of the uh, uh, respected uh, previous speaker talks about the about the uh, uh, diaspora of uh, Azerbaijan living in Turkey celebrated along with the Turkish people so there has been a clear cut concept uh, about the one state and two nation about among all the uh, Turk uh, speaking nation so that was the reflection, vivid reflection of this concept. The military defeat caused significant internal political tensions uh, in Armenia. It weakened the country's economy, civility, and social fabric, which are now under great stress. So you might be knowing um, uh, in different uh, English news channels and regional channels, highlighting the uh, social um, unrest, political chaos, uh, uh, in, 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 in Armenia after the defeat. It victory, its victory has also opened the door of greater regional connectivity, socio-economic integration uh, in terms of food and energy cooperation. And uh, day before, uh, some days ago, there was a very significant uh, MOU was signed between uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey uh, uh, about the export of uh, uh, Nakhchivan, uh, um, uh, gas pipeline to uh, Turkey. Uh, so there have been uh, uh, many meaningful, effective uh, dialogue and cooperation in terms of uh, energy cooperation previously, which will be further enhanced after the consolidation of Azerbaijan uh, in the uh, occupied areas, liberated areas. <clears throat> So there will be opening of land corridor connecting Turkey to Azerbaijan. Could other uh, Turkic, uh, Turkic uh, countries, namely Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkmenistan. And uh, some days ago, government of Pakistan has already announced uh, the trilateral uh, railway uh, uh, mega project connecting Pakistan, Turkey, and Iran. And it will be uh, probably uh, pass very near to the uh, Nakhchivan uh, region. So um, uh, geographically, uh, now the distance uh, to uh, Iran is, is uh, some uh, minutes 
uh, and Turkey to some hours. So it uh, has created a new, new uh, geography in South Caucasus, which will be discussed uh, later. Azerbaijan, Russia, Turkey, and Pakistan has emerged as winners, whereas Armenia, UA, uh, EU, USA, Iran, and India are the loser sides. The nature of the Azerbaijani-Armenian uh, conflict reflects a changing international environment. The United States, unfortunately, uh, seems to have withdrawn from global affairs. The EU has no military muscles and West in general has grown alienated from Turkey and Russia. Putin, the president of Russia, has succeeded considerably expanding Russian military presence in the strategical uh, important South Caucasus region. And he done so without countering any Western pushback. This unchecked advance should set alarm bells ringing in others ex-Soviet republics such as Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. Okay, okay, I think... Uh, just, to, just to conclude. conclude. Yes. Uh, the, the biggest loser is actually the European Union. It failed yet again to be relevant player and a peace broker on its eastern border. EU was helplessly looked as Russia invaded Georgia in 2028 and enticed up Ukraine in 2014. So I conclude that uh, uh, Tehran, uh, Iran uh, will also be a loser. And one of the interesting uh, development which uh, have been um, uh, taking place in the regional uh, international media and regional media was the uh, normalization ties and uh, expected uh, uh, acceptance or uh, ties with Israel, with Pakistan. It's also important to note that Israel's support to Baku, raising the uh, prospects of a reset between Tel Aviv and Islamabad. And it may be a turning point for Pakistan uh, after the victory of Azerbaijan to have at least a, some uh, normal ties with Israel in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Khan. And this was very interesting for us to, to see Pakistani perspective because when you walk in Baku, you will see a lot of uh, Turkish flags, Pakistani flags, Israeli flags. So I think that uh, we should involve Pakistani perspective into our conference. Now to wrap up our panel and to move towards more Q&A session, I would like to give the floor to our Dean uh, of School of Public and International Affairs, Dr. Anar Valiev. Uh, Dr. Valiev um, is already involved with several projects related to the construction of the Nagorno Karabakh region. Uh, but uh, now let's give him a chance to 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 uh, give an Azerbaijani perspective on on the issue. Well, thank you very much, Faris. Uh, since a lot of people discussed the perspective of the foreign countries, United States, European Union, and other countries on, on Azerbaijan, it would be nice to see that what was Azerbaijani public perception of other countries, uh, especially during the Karabakh war, and how it will affect the uh, mutual or relationship between Azerbaijan and all other countries. As you rightly mentioned, uh, that was really not strange, but really surprising to see the cars right during this last month, I mean, October, November, to see the cars in Azerbaijan or stores that were decorated by the flags of four countries, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Pakistan, and Israel. So the four countries that absolutely maybe has, I don't say it has nothing to do with each other, but it was really strange to see these flags on the cars in Baku. And that shows that actually Baku is a multinational country, but it's not because of the multinationality, but because of the perception of Azerbaijani, how they perceive certain type of the countries and how it, they helped to Azerbaijan in this war. And how this perception also will affect Azerbaijan relations with other countries. So it, if divide, who divide, decided to divide Azerbaijan countries onto the three countries for which Azerbaijan has a positive, neutral and negative 
kind of perception, I would first of all just to go for the positive. Well, definitely on the line of the positive countries is definitely number one country it's coming to the Turkey because it's both its president's political establishment were helping to Azerbaijan. The second comes with Pakistan because of mostly about the political support that comes from that country. And then there's a several countries that the support was not necessarily visible, but in perception of Azerbaijanis were considered as a, one of the most important, especially one was Israel that helped Azerbaijan to uh, completely change the, the warfare in Karabakh and especially with the weapons that, that uh, Israel uh, provided Azerbaijan uh, starting from 2013 and especially 2016 and 2020, kind of the conflict. Next one was Ukraine. That was also positive, especially with the mass media relations. And there was a, some kind of the uh, contributions of Ukrainian military uh, industrial complex to Azerbaijan. And finally, it was UK, United Kingdom, although it doesn't provide uh, Azerbaijan with any kind of the material technical support. Uh, I would say that the UK's role was mostly in helping Azerbaijan to bring its position to the United Nations. So I would say this five countries mostly, and definitely, of course, from the other European nations, it was Italy, uh, a couple of other countries, but mostly this is the five countries that was helping Azerbaijan both positively and uh, population see them from positive perspective. Then we come to the neutral positive type of the uh, country that was helping Azerbaijan, among them was uh, definitely it was uh, Georgia, uh, part of China, uh, some countries of the former Soviet republics, uh, such as Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, even Russia was considered as a neutral, partly not positively, not negatively, but neutral, because for many uh, weeks Russia was standing on Azerbaijani mm -hmm. position, claiming that stating that the conflict is happening not on territory of Armenia, but on territory of Azerbaijan. So there's no need for Russia to get involved into this conflict. Uh, the, as definitely the people kind of discussed over here, who are the biggest losers uh, in our uh, case? So the biggest losers, those countries that in uh, eyes of many Azerbaijanis considered as a negative, and the relations with these countries will be uh, if not destroyed, but at least will be impacted in very negative uh, perspective. Definitely this country is a France, and unfortunately the position of France also casts a shadow on the relations between Azerbaijan and EU, and I expect that in March uh, of next year or April next year when we have an annual uh, public opinion poll conducted by EU office in Baku, the public perception of EU would be kind of would somehow decrease and Italian role will not be able to offset the France stance in the in this conflict. The next one definitely was Armenia uh, from that perspective. Iran is another kind of the country that, uh, if not positively, but we expected more support from Iranian establishment, uh, if not militarily, but at least politically, but would it, as a Virginia public hadn't seen it. And definitely, uh, I would say that Arab, world also took a neutral position or sometime negative position, especially in the case of the uh, spreading the lies about mercenaries. So I want to kind of mention that the first uh, reports of mass media about that Azerbaijan allegedly uh, employed mercenaries from Syria was coming out from in Arab press. And then it was reprinted, reprinted by uh, Guardian, uh, Daily Telegraph, uh, Independent, and so on. So it was coming from the Arab uh, press that was kind of the negatively looked at Azerbaijan. And definitely United States, I wouldn't put it as a negatively, but I would say partly negative uh, neutral position because we haven't seen clear statements or clear kind of the support for Azerbaijani cause in that kind of example. So, uh, uh, shortly, just summarizing what, I, what my statement is about, is that this kind of a division on the three countries would be a, uh, especially the support or not support of Azerbaijan during the Karabakh war would be uh, critical in future building relations with Azerbaijan. As you can see that in reconstruction of Karabakh, uh, Azerbaijani president, Azerbaijani government gave more emphasis on the country that was a positive to Azerbaijan. This country is again is a Turkey, Pakistan, 
uh, Ukraine, Italy especially, and there's no, you don't see any other kind of the European countries like a Belgium, Netherlands, uh, or France that was kind of the looking at Azerbaijan from negative perspective during the war. That would be my kind of perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valiev. We have some now time for Q&A session. Uh, our students are writing on the chat box and some of them are sending me emails and uh, on WhatsApp. We have here Aysel Almazov, who is uh, from Georgia. Uh, she was intrigued by Dr. Mamouka Tsertele's speech and she wants to ask him about Javakhetia. Um, generally, I asked this question yesterday and I want to re repeat this question again, whether you think this uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflicts uh, war and the way it was, uh, you know, ended up has any implications for regional conflicts, regional uh, frozen conflicts in Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine. So that is sort of. I said, do you want to ask you a question? Do you want to turn on your yes. microphone? And, yes. Please turn on the camera and microphone and ask your question. Go First ahead. of all, uh, thank you so much for organizing this event. It's my pleasure to talk to you. Uh, to have opportunity to talk uh, such remarkable people, uh, such successful people who can make a remarkable change in, for society. And um, uh, Mr. Mamuka, Mr. Tzaratelli, Kamar Jabat Ragur Zandavit, Zalian Gamikhar, that's Koni Dana, Hot Koni Sahel de Gore Dawin, Zalian Gamikhar, the Miss Twilsi Damoda, Metki Kartulak, it's hot Komere, we pick our English to Dagis from Kit Hot, it was Rata Gaigon, Swebmats. I this is the this is I the most important language that everybody needs to learn going I didn't forward. I didn't expect that we are going to have Georgian as a as a language of communication in our forum. <laughs> uh, then I'll ask my question in English. Please. Uh, yes, I would like to hear your thoughts and how did you react on the fact when Jawaheti was tagged as as separately from Georgia. And as we know, Armenia's Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan claimed to a region within Georgia in his post on social media. He wrote Armenia's Jawah as caption to a photo that actually showed Georgia's Javakheti. Uh, I'll start with the saying that obviously uh, the perspective of uh, um, sovereignty is the most important uh, element for uh, uh, stability and, and respect to the sovereignty is most important factor of the stability in, in our part of the world. I think uh, too many times, uh, and it used to be mostly coming from the uh, powers who are not interested in stability in our region and mostly in, in, in jo I, from Georgian perspective, I could be very open about that, that our northern neighbor uh, is uh, for uh, more than 100 years uh, since uh, first republics of, uh, of of South Caucasus were established, tried to find the ways to uh, manipulate with the situation, carve the borders uh, according to uh, their perspectives of of uh, uh, potential conflicts that may be emerging in, a, in 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 those territories and so forth. Uh, so, uh, territorial integrity of Georgia is the most important element of, of stability from the perspective of obviously Georgia, but also from international perspective. And uh, any violation or attempt of violation of territorial integrity of Georgia, whether it's uh, uh, political or military or otherwise, is obviously uh, unacceptable from not only Georgian again perspective, but from international perspective as well. In some cases, because of the military manipulations, because of the manipulation with the separatist regions and so forth, uh, our ne northern neighbor managed to uh, create an environment where uh, these manipulations translated into uh, into hot conflicts and th that resulted to the serious uh, damage to not only stability in the region, but also uh, violation of sovereignty of, of Georgian state. I don't expect this uh, development to take place with, with regard to Jawaheti, frankly speaking. I think uh, understanding of importance of Georgia uh, for um, some uh, social economic life of Armenia is, I think, still uh, still there, still dominant. And uh, 
uh, obviously there will be always hotheads who try to create some problems uh, and uh, there will be others who will be supporting from outside of the region but i don't expect that uh, that um, uh, some of the either insensitivities or sometime uh, provocations could uh, could elevate to the level of escalation uh, of of this uh, uh, of this potential uh, to the to the level of potential conflict. So I don't expect that to take place. But obviously, uh, none of this type of uh, provocative. And by the way, I have not seen that uh, statement on the social tweet, so I cannot comment specifically on that. But I could say that any. Uh, provocation of, of this uh, that will somehow infringe in the sovereignty of uh, particular neighboring countries in the region in the times of this type of uh, challenges should be perceived as provocation and uh, shouldn't be addressed like that. Okay. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you, you so it. much. Thank you, Kamar Joba. I said thank you for your question. Um, <laughs> I, I have a question for our American participants because. Uh, everybody is saying about the declining uh, power of the U.S. Everybody is talking about, uh, you know, isolationism that U.S. is going through. But um, this is a critical part of the world. This is the crossroads of uh, many important, uh, you know, transit routes. Um, the question is whether U.S. is uh, looking at peacekeeping, Russian peacekeepers as a threat, or they're looking at Russian peacekeepers as a uh, temporary important solution to the uh, war, to the uh, bloodshed. So the perspective of Washington towards Russian peacekeepers, that is question number two, uh, question number one. And question number two, uh, do you expect that uh, somehow American companies uh, can get involved with some reconstruction works, with financing of the uh, redevelopment works, infrastructure projects, joint ventures, Maybe that could be an opportunity for U.S. to be uh, slowly uh, increase their presence in the region. So both to Mr. Doran and to Mr. Luke Coffey. Uh, Luke, do you have to go? Yes, you I know? think Luke has no, to he, go. Yeah. So maybe no, I'm OK now. I can stay until the end. Thank you. Yeah, uh, OK. Go okay. ahead, Mike. Uh, uh, so. First, just a, a, a statement about uh, U.S. Uh, let's say decline or or retreat. Um, the United States is going to remain um, the most powerful country in the world uh, for some time. I hope it's a very long time uh, as as an American. Uh, but the the United States can make itself um, a, a major factor or the major factor in almost any issue in the world. Um, so um, the the problem the problem is is less I think decline than lack of strategic focus, um, and that's one of the things I was trying to um, uh, trying to impart in 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 my comments. Um, the United States it, it seems to me the issue that I'm most concerned about about the United States in general, but especially about an issue like the South Caucasus is that it has lost um, a sense of its purpose in the world, a, a, a clarity of what it's of what it's supposed to be doing. And a lot of the discussions about foreign policy in Washington are actually discussions about domestic politics in the guise of foreign of, of, of foreign policy. I see this happening more and more, and it's uh, uh, it's very disturbing. I mean, the whole discussion of Russia, in the United States and Washington over the last five years has been surreal uh, because of all of these um, efforts to uh, uh, claim that Russia, you know, that Russia elected Donald Trump uh, and, um, and and so forth. Um, the reason why I think uh, Azerbaijan should be interested, I, let, let me just say, I can imagine if that, that some of the top people in Azerbaijan, I have no reason to believe this, but I can imagine uh, looking at the outcome of the war, I can imagine them saying, you know, the Americans, they're, they're, they're really not worth that much anymore. I mean, they're really not, they weren't present here. We won the war on our own or together with our, uh, with, uh, with our allies. 
Russia took a, a, a quote-unquote neutral position. Obviously, we know, we know it's not exactly neutral, but they, uh, they at least Russia recognized the um, the uh, 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 the sovereignty of Azerbaijan um, over the territories and over Karabakh, and 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 this is this is all we need, really. Um, I think that that would be a mistaken perspective uh, because. Uh, I think that it wouldn't be a controversial uh, position to say that Azerbaijan could not have achieved it, uh, what it, all that it achieved without Turkey, uh, and that Turkey played uh, um, a very significant role uh, in deterring uh, uh, Russia, that the, the outcome, the Russians accepted, you know, Putin accepted the sovereignty of uh, uh, of Azerbaijan. He used an international legal argument to justify non-intervention, but it was not international law that convinced him not to intervene. There was that was the that was the justification he gave. There were lots of other calculations that that went into um, his decision to restrict Russian aspirations to Lechen and uh, um, and certain parts of, of, of Karabakh. So um, uh, you can imagine, if you look at the history, uh, you know, take the long view of um, Turkish, uh, uh, Turkish um, interests in the South Caucasus, there's no guarantee that Turkey will remain as involved in the South Caucasus today uh, uh, as it is now. Um, I certainly hope this continues. I think it's a good thing. But if you look at the whole history of, of Turkey in general, you see that Turkey goes through periods of um, periods of strength, followed by periods of, uh, of, of you know, of, of internal, um, just, uh, let's just say, lack of cohesion, lack of lack of focus. So I think the ideal, the, the reason why Azerbaijan needs the United States is that it wants the United States to be coming in behind Turkey. Um, and being supportive of uh, um, of Turkey, the United States doesn't have to be directly involved on the ground uh, in very significant ways, but it needs to have the picture of the world that sees that the the Turkish Azerbaijani relationship as one of great benefit to the United States, which indeed I I I think it is. It doesn't mean we have to be challenging the Russians in every place, like, like during the Cold War, but we just need to see this as um, as a, as beneficial, and we need to back up the the, the Turks in, in what they're doing. So, you know, the to this your specific questions, I um, I think certainly getting American companies um, in, in involved uh, is a good thing. I think. Um, uh, w increasing the understanding, and this is going to may be a surprising statement to you. Um, re incre increasing the understanding in Israel of the value of Azerbaijan to Israel, and increasing the understanding in Washington of the value of Azerbaijan to Israel um, would be, I think, um, uh, very, very significant. Because the reason I say that is that is that. Uh, one thing I discovered in my trip to Azerbaijan and my discussions, I have I, a lot of contacts in Israel inside the government, outside the government, and I discovered that the Azerbaijani-Israeli relationship is very well understood among those officials in the Israeli government who are dealing directly with Azerbaijan and a little bit beyond that. But the wider, the wider, if you can call it, strategic community in Israel is not really is not really paying attention. It shocked me to find this out, uh, really, uh, and and not paying attention to those factors that I mentioned before about the influence of Azerbaijan, the larger influence in the region, the influence on Turkey. I mean, Azerbaijan pulls Turkey in a Turkish nationalist direction rather than an Islamist direction, the exact opposite of what the propaganda was telling us at the time. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, I would want to, I would want to see, I, I think what, um, that what Azerbaijan should seek to do is get companies involved for sure, but also bring people from Capitol Hill uh, uh, and people from the American strategic community uh, on visits to Azerbaijan to understand um, the, 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 the larger context. I hate to say this about my country. It used to not be true at all, but um, you cannot, you, 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 we are becoming, as I said, increasingly parochial. 
And I think that you have to see part of your job is educating Americans about why you matter to, uh, to America. And I can see why you think, uh, to a certain extent, that's not really necessary because we did it all on our own. But uh, as I say, having the United States there in the background, I think, would be extremely valuable. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Luke Kofi can cover these questions as well, but there's also a question from our student Nurai Bashirli, who is specifically for Luke Kofi, uh, asking whether it would be wrong to cooperate politically and commercially with those countries that were on the other side of the war uh, in Karabakh. So, Luke, there's a specific question for you, but you can also add. <coughs> add yeah, thanks. My question um, as well. Thanks. Uh, on the. <clears throat> your, your your two questions about um, how the U.S. views the situation of Russian peacekeepers and about U.S. companies. Uh, I agree with Mike on, on it would be great if U.S. companies were involved. I think if there's money to be made, U.S. companies will want to get involved, especially if they see the, the tendering processes and the contracting processes as being a level and fair playing field, um, then they, they will want to get involved. And I think it'd be it'd be a uh, a positive thing, in terms of U.S. perception of um, what's happening in Azerbaijan and the conflict. Uh, you have to differentiate between the different parts of the U.S. government and the U.S. governing system. Um, I wouldn't say that the U.S. government during this conflict was um, pro Azerbaijani or pro Armenia uh, as a whole. For sure, some comments that came from Secretary Pompeo were more sympathetic to Armenia. But as was already discussed, this has to be seen through the lens of U.S. relations with Turkey. Um, so I wouldn't take it personally. <laughs> it was just a, another way for um, the U.S. government to try to beat up Turkey. Um, and unfortunately, Azerbaijan was the collateral damage in this. But when you speak to people in, in, in the Department of Defense, they understand the, the importance of the U.S.-Azerbaijani relationship because of all the cooperation since 9-11, because of the overflight rights uh, to resupply U.S. forces in, in, in Afghanistan. Um, so, the, you know, there's a completely different attitude and different mood you can find in the Department of Defense than you can find in some places in the, in the State Department. And then you have the Hill. Right, which in our presidential system of government um, can influence foreign policy, can sometimes make foreign policy, but it doesn't have the total competency over foreign policy making. And the you know congressmen they often pass non-binding resolutions and declaring that you know Artsakh is a sovereign state and Azerbaijan is terrible and this and that. That we should always remember that these are these have been non-binding. They they're meaningless. I mean, they're they're as worth as much as you know this, this paper right here. You know, it, it has no legal impact or legal authority, uh, but it causes problems because there's a perception from the outside that uh, you know unless <clears throat> unless you know how the Congress works and how some resolutions are non-binding and how some are in law then uh, you think that everything that comes out of the U.S. Congress is like the official position of the U.S. government. And it's not the case at all. And working against a country like Azerbaijan is a very powerful and influential diaspora. Um, and the number one thing this diaspora has to do, like most um, non-governmental organizations in America, is raise money. So they raise money by getting everyone worked up into excitement and into a fit, and, and then this translates onto Capitol Hill, and then you have this perception that the U.S. is pro-Armenia. Whereas I would say in this particular conflict, with a major U.S. presidential election campaign that was taking place, with a, with a, a pandemic that has ripped across most of America, your average American, and including your average policymaker, didn't really care about this conflict, if I'm being honest with you. Um, they should have, but most of them really didn't. Uh, yeah. So that's why people like Mike and I and Mamuka in Washington, we try to do our best to inform 
the commentators inform the policymakers on why the South Caucasus is important and why the outcome of this conflict uh, is important for the U.S. Now, on the specific question, forgive me, I may not understand it properly, but if you're asking if countries Maybe that were France. on the other side... Referring, and, yeah, referring to France, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say, referring <laughs> to France. Um, look, of course, Azerbaijani French relations are, are you know, at, at, at a low point. Um, should this mean that French companies shouldn't, uh, French companies separate from the government shouldn't get involved with the reconstruction? I'm a hardcore capitalist, right? So if it's a private company and if it's offering the best service at the best price, then I would say be open-minded to this, right? But I could see the hesitancy or the reluctance um, to involving certain companies from France in the reconstruction. And I suspect that, you know, the, the Turkish construction companies, which are internationally respected um, and will have a, a, an advantage, a built-in advantage, will probably be the, con the, the, the companies most involved with the reconstruction efforts. But I would love to see U.S. Uh, US companies involved, um, but it remains to be seen if this will be the case. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I would like to remind that during visit of President Sarkozy to Baku, the amount of contracts signed between Azerbaijan and France was uh, 1.5 billion uh, euros. So those good times are probably not going to be repeated. Um, we have uh, a question from a student for Anar to Anar Valiev uh, about the social media and media coverage. Do you think that, uh, Anar, there's a question for you. Do you think that now that the war is over, there will be more positive uh, coverage of Azerbaijan in Western media? That's the question. Well, let's before the understanding that first of all, let's understand why there was a negative coverage in media, especially with the mercenaries issues about as if Azerbaijan did some atrocities. So it was not actually directed against Azerbaijan. It was mostly directed against Turkey. And most of these countries or most of these mass media saw us as a proxy of Turkey. So if you look at where the first uh, information about mercenaries appeared, it was first BBC service, Arabic service. That is very close with the government of United Arab Emirates versus Al Jazeera, who is supportive of Turkey, was also supportive of us. So you can see this two kind of the stream of Arab streets when one kind of the pro Saudi, pro United Arab Emirates were anti-Turkish and logically was anti-Azerbaijani because they wanted to push Turkey or hit Turkey as if the Turkey transporting mercenaries to Azerbaijan and so on. And then you saw pro-Turkey media such as Al Jazeera that was pro-Azerbaijani from that perspective. I don't expect that this uh, has to do with the Karabakh war. It was, has to do with the Turkey. So it, it's a lot, the law depends not because of us, but it depends on the Turkish relations with the Arab world. And I see that it's slowly changing because Turkey is building its positive relation with right now with Saudi Arabia, slowly building relations with kind of positive relations with United Arab Emirates. And I expect that this anti-Turkish and anti-Azerbaijani uh, propaganda will slowly fade away. OK, thank you. We have a Tajik student at ADA University asking a question about the status of Karabakh. I would like to address this question to our Pakistani expert because he went into detail about the uh, November 9 agreement. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hassan Khan, maybe you can comment about the agreement and why it didn't address the, the actual political and legal status of Karabakh. Uh, we cannot hear you, Dr. Khan, so maybe you can turn on the... Uh, yes, now we can hear you, yes. Oh, no. It's, it's, it, we cannot hear you. Please turn on the microphone. Yeah, unmuted. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes. Now, now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, 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 the trilateral uh, uh, tripart agreement between among the uh, among Russia, uh, Azerbaijan, and Armenia uh, speak the emergence of new uh, geopolitical uh, reality or geostrategic emerging trends in South Caucasus, which means that. Uh, 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 in international or regionally, uh, uh, the the status of uh, 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 USA has been eroded 
by the status quo of uh, or by the allies of uh, alliance of russia and turkey so let us talk uh, specifically about about the about the uh, peace agreement truce agreement amongst the uh, different states uh, stakeholders namely uh, azerbaijan armenia and russia uh frankly speaking uh, it uh, consolidated uh, uh, the uh, geo strategic uh, uh, position of azerbaijan and um, uh, further weakened uh, the geopolitical socio economic and geo strategic uh, standing of armenia uh it uh, uh, it uh, uh, granted the supremacy of russian uh, peace group uh to be patrolled uh, uh, to be stationed um, uh, on different part of uh, 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 regions uh, in order to to deescalate the tension and uh, uh, maintain the uh, peace agreement uh, in a good manner and and it also uh, provided uh, the, uh, a, a supremacy in terms of socio economic uh, integration well uh, being of uh, armen azerbaijan uh, idps uh, to be again uh, populated in in liberated areas and of course uh, a, a very docile uh, destructive kind of nature to uh, armenian people previously living in in the illegally occupied uh, areas of uh, uh, azerbaijan and gorokorabakh Yes, uh, as, as, as some days ago, the Parliament of uh, Turkey has already uh, uh, granted the permission uh, to uh, uh, to Turkish uh, uh, troops uh, to be uh, stationed uh, in the uh, different uh, uh, regions uh, uh, in, inside of Azerbaijan. so all in all uh, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, good uh, truce and uh, after uh, truce uh, there was uh, some some incident of uh, uh, escalation against um, uh, border at uh, dif- uh, tension at different borders but uh, thanks god that uh, yeah. uh, peacekeeper russia and turkey uh, managed to maintain the status quo Thank you. status quo has uh, and will be maintained uh, for the collective security of the south caucasus thank, thank you thank you thank you we have uh, our journal editor ada university's journal editor mr damian kurnevich here uh, please you have a question i think th- this will be our final question because time is already limited We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Anya. Oh, I think Damian has a microphone problems. Yes, okay. There's a microphone problem. There's a microphone problem. There was uh, one final question about international financial institutions including EBRD Asian Development Bank and others uh, whether uh, you think that would be a good idea to involve them especially considering all uh, some opportunities from China's Belt and Road Initiative so anybody wants to comment on these international projects being uh, applicable for Karabakh's reconstruction if i yes. may just very briefly and yes uh, please please don't uh, yeah. there, before going there just one half a minute on uh, uh, look and uh, Mr. Donan touched the issue of how to raise visibility of of Azerbaijan in uh, in, in Washington and how kind of turn this tide into positive. I think probably I'm I'm a, I'm oldest here and I remember very well in late 90s and early 2000 uh, how uh, regional approach and common regional voice attracted more attention from Washington policymakers than individual countries trying to pursue their uh, individual interests in in Washington. I think speaking with one voice as a region in washington will attract us more attention and more focus of policy makers so i think that one important advice i have towards all the countries of the region to find common interest like luke was touching this issue 5 plus 2 5 c plus 2 uh, in, in initiative and many other initiatives but i think we have to be clear uh, 
the uh, time and, and uh, attention span of Washington officials is limited. Mm -hmm. And in order to attract that attention, it's easier if we come, come, come up here with the common strategy, common approach and common focus that will attract us more attention. Uh, uh, I think uh, answering your question, clearly international financial institutions will be interested in participation in reconstruction, obviously, as long as, long as modalities in the in the uh, in the region are allowing that ADB, EBRD and others are already very active in the region and they have many tools to participate in the reconstruction pro process as long as uh, uh, conditions are right and as long as uh, uh, obviously uh, sides are uh, welcoming those participation. One right. last comment I wanted to uh, I want to make uh, is about the three C's initiative that Luke mentioned. I think uh, with this. Uh, 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 the changes in the in geopolitical shift in the region, I think we need to pay a little bit more attention about how not only uh, uh, the region, Caspian region in general, Azerbaijan and others are connected through uh, Turkey to Mediterranean and the uh, rest of Europe, but also to think about more uh, how uh, this can be complemented with the uh, connectivity through Black Sea as well to strategic partners like Ukraine, Romania and other countries. So and this is a potential that I, I think underutilized and uh, both Azerbaijan and Georgia should be probably focusing more and down the road. Who knows if 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 some kind of settlement is achieved in a longer term settlement is achieved, maybe Armenia will be part of that as well. But at this stage, it's essential for Georgia and Azerbaijan to work closer on on, uh, on strengthening that Black Sea connectivity that would then bring Caspian see naturally into uh, this initiative. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I would like to, we have reached the end of our discussion, very rich discussion. I would like to thank all the um, speakers uh, from Washington, uh, Mr. Mike Doran, Mr. Luke Kofi from Pakistan, our dear friend and partner, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Hassan Khan, and also our long-term uh, ally and friend and partner, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Katsaretelli. Uh, all, uh, all of you uh, have made excellent introductions and I'm glad that our Dean, Dr. Anar Veliev, could also join and participate to give Azerbaijani perspective. Uh, we are wrapping up two days of intense discussions on the University of Kent is also here with us. Um, I hope that this was interesting for the participants. Um, we had um, almost 170 participants registered, and I hope that uh, some of the uh, some of the comments, interventions were useful. We are planning to publish this uh, because we recorded all the proceedings, and we will publish this. Uh, and later on, we will send you the. Uh, Dr. Kastelova, would you like to say something at the end, or shall we wrap up? Um. Hello, um, thank you very much, uh, Faris, and thank you very much to all the speakers. Two days of fantastic, in-depth, insightful discussions. Uh, and this is only the beginning, despite the fact that the project is uh, in its final year, but I'm sure we can, we can continue these discussions because this is important for all of us, not just an academic community, but definitely for policymakers, especially in addressing these uh, crucial, important issues. So thank you to the organizers, thank you to other universities, thank you to Nargis, especially, um, and, and her team. And uh, let's continue. Let's make it a regular feature because it has been so successful. So well done to you all and um, happy festive season to you all Thanks. and a healthy and positive new year. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you just beat me by one minute. I also wanted to say huge thank you to Nargis and her team at the Center for EU Excellence uh, for organizing this. And happy holidays, dear friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Happy holidays. Yeah, right? Happy holidays.